<laughs> the meeting hall has a big red X through it, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. That shit is gone. Yeah. Actually, let me show you this. There's a little memento of last session. <laughs> the doctor, yeah, the doctor and Sparky's right. handiwork. Yeah, Jacob, awesome. yeah, yeah. Jacob had nothing to do with it, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, I, just, I think it did most of my damage outside. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Did you had awesome? Did you had awesome? Dude, that was. Shooting your Lothatep in the face. Oh yeah, that was pretty <laughs> awesome. Uh, I, yeah, for, for maximum for maximum damage. The doctor opening up, you know, with his with his catchphrase, fucking whips back the tarp. Raw. <laughs> <laughs> what is this rude interruption? Oh my god, dude! So so awesome. It was unfortunate. We're trapped in there, but I think anybody expected that to happen. Hey, um, Sean, can you I drop didn't. some of these uh, <laughs> MP3s that you you play into like a Google Dropbox for us? Um, no. Because it's uh, all it, it's all pulled from roll twenty. It's all pulled. Well, not roll twenty directly. It's from uh, what's it called? Fan burst. Fan burst. Yeah. Pretty much everything I'm I've been using is from fan burst. So I should just be able to go to fan burst, right? Yeah, you can go into fan burst and uh, find a lot of the stuff. But the, the Roll20 program just basically lets me, you know, click an add button. And then I'll click on the fan burst uh, tab. And then I'll just search, you know, like horror or horror ambient or Cthulhu or something. It'll give me a whole list of shit that people have uploaded. And I can just add them to sort of a jukebox panel on my screen. And I bet I have probably... 150 or more tracks in here just in different menus like I've got main mix action ambient horror chants and gibbering intermission nature ambient cave ambience cave Love. ambience <laughs> cave on the cave ambience. yeah and then there's a, if you search, if you go to Fanburst and search Lovecraft, there's some really good uh, original orchestration stuff in there that, for Lovecraft that you can get. Lovecrafty in the name of the city. Yeah, I think uh, the main artist is Armandio. Armandio? A R M A N D E O. He's got some cool shit. What's up, Tom? Tom, how's it going, guys? Feeling better? Much better. Night and day. Good. Being sick sucks, man. I had bronchitis over the holidays. I'm getting over that. Yeah, it was. I think I had the flu. I don't know. I just, I, I just, it was just so bad. And then I think Monday, or was it Sunday? I just I passed out on the couch and took a nap. And mm -hmm. I just woke up. I was like, whoa, I feel better. It was like, it was weird. You know, just like I needed that. After, after six days of being deathly ill, right after, yeah, I just feel the difference. It was crazy. No, oh, that's, that's cool, man. Yeah. When you start feeling better. That was oh, the moment yeah. your body crushed the virus, man. 
Exactly, exactly. You could just you could you know could time it. It's like there it is. So never here, we'll, start. we'll show we'll show Tom the aftermath of the meeting hall here. Just as a reminder, of what happened last session. There we go. Beautiful. All, all you, Doctor Van Helsing. Beautiful. Remember Come that. On. That's a little. <laughs> uh, that's a little messy. It is. Maybe a little more messy than it actually was, but. I think that's when the roof came down. That's what it looked like. Yeah. <laughs> It's called Cthulhu. Yeah, there's gotta, be, gotta be a lot of blood. Look like a, a great white concert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so so let's just review a bit, shall we? Um, so Tom, Doctor Van Helsing was able to flee the scene. Uh, with uh, Bugsy driving, right, and uh. I'm assuming that you would have gone back to the bungalow where you guys I, were staying. And I think, didn't I grab uh, Alex? That's uh, right. Yes. You have the ambassador with you. Yep. Cause I thought he was my daughter. Yes. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> right. So, <laughs> uh, that passes, uh, your temporary insanity, uh, passes somewhat. Oh, yeah. You're, I'm good. Yeah. You're, you're yeah, still, you're, you're still a little unstable. Okay. Um, but once you get back to the bungalow, you quickly realize that the ambassador has pretty much lost it. Um, he's uh, suffering from delusions. He's seeing things that aren't there. Um, he's just uh, speaking in incoherently, screaming. Um, and he seems to suffer from this uh, extreme indecisiveness. Like he can't decide what, what he wants to do. He's, he's going over, you know, like we need to do this. We need to do that. No, we can't do this. And um, eventually, you know, after just a little bit of time spent back at the bungalow, you have to sedate him because he's just out of control. Wow. Okay. As some time passes, uh, nobody else shows up back at the bungalow. Um, so you're not you sure. You're not sure not what is who the other driver. No, uh, uh. Yeah. It's, it's just uh, you and Bugsy and Bugsy seems to be sort of in a state of shock himself. Um, and you know, several hours pass, um, and Jacob and Marshall have not shown up at the, uh, at the bungalow. <laughs> So just suffice it to say the night passes um, and these guys still haven't shown up. Uh, with a little bit of effort, you're able to find out over the you know period of the next day or, or two that Marshall has been uh, interned at the, uh, he's, he was being kept at the uh, Manhattan State Hospital. Um, apparently he was found um, on the street, um, acting very strangely, and the cops picked him up, and uh, they basically had to put him in a padded cell uh, for a couple of days because he was just acting just kind of out of control and saying some just weird and wild shit. Um, Jacob, on the other hand, you find out in the newspapers actually that. Uh, Jacob was picked up by the police as well. Apparently the night of the event at the meeting hall, he wound up in the subway somewhere in Manhattan and he killed nine people Ooh. in the subway. And uh, he's being held for uh, nine counts of capital murder. Um, also at the Manhattan State Hospital. <clears throat> he has been deemed insane. Thought they were German Cthulian soldiers, <laughs> right? In the yeah. trenches, man, in the trenches. Ah, yeah. Flashbacks, All right? All right sure. Hold on one second. I'll be right back. Hello. 
Hello. Hello? Oh, okay. All right. My phone rang and then it screwed everything up. So, okay. So anyway, the newspaper and uh, he was picked up and I was something about the newspaper and I lost you. Right. You see in the newspaper, there's a story about Jacob Cronenshield uh, being apprehended by the police um, after killing nine, brutally murdering nine people in the subway, just nine civilians. Um, some of them were shot. Some of them were uh, stabbed and uh, the police picked him up and uh, he's going to, he, he's basically being charged with nine counts of murder. And he's being held at a mental ward at the Manhattan State Hospital. Same place where Marshall Sparks is being held. However, after a, after, same place. Yeah. after a couple of days, though, Sparky, you're, you're released. Um, you, you come to your senses and, you know, you just kind of explain that you give them some bullshit story. You know, like maybe your, your wife left you or, a, you know, your girlfriend left you and you just kind of lost it. Or, or claim drunkenness or whatever. Uh, but they have no reason to hold you. And you are released. Fantastic. I pick him up. <clears throat> okay, you do. <laughs> and, uh, and I also get... Uh, do I know what's happened with Jacob? No, you <laughs> don't. I'm assuming the doctor would probably tell you when he picks you up. Yeah. Can I get Jacob uh, an attorney? Oh, his his attorneys are already involved. Okay. He he has a whole team of attorneys um, that that are working on this. Were there right. witnesses, or was everybody killed? I'm a war hero. I freaked out, man. Yeah, really there insane. were there were witnesses. Yes, there, there there's no doubt that he's guilty. I mean, he was covered in blood and. You know, <laughs> is are like totally perfect. Mm -hmm. Sanities are totally geared for all that. Yeah, but the the newspaper article has also mentioned that that Mr. Cronenshield is uh, is being held at the mental ward. They're not very specific as to his condition, uh, but you're assuming that um, he has you know lost his mind. <laughs> Uh, in some way or another, that seeing that um, at the meeting Bloody tongue, man. the other night, just uh, he just lost it. <clears throat> hmm. Well, all right. So this is not this is not good news. Mm -mm. Sparky's a little despondent about it. It's like, oh no, not Jacob. Um. Can we go see him at all, or you know, once we? Um, okay, well, yeah, you can do some inquiries, but I should also mention, Kyle, that that Sparky, you're having a little trouble at this point remembering what happened that uh, night. I asked the doctor. Yeah, as the doctor begins to describe it to you, I ask, are you sure you want to know? <laughs> well, I have a total memory loss. I. <clears throat> I know we were planning to to go go in there and take care of business. Did did we do that? Yeah, we took care of a lot of business, but something there was something else there. Something of a of an hideous and evil nature. And it grew and it got big. And nothing I could do, no matter how much I shot it. It had no impact. Yeah, Sparky, you do have a vague memory of, and, and perhaps it's invaded your dream somewhat. The headshot. Uh, over the last couple <laughs> of days. Uh, no, a shadow. A shadow sort of rising into the sky, blotting out the light of the stars and the moon. Just some vague image of a shadow in your mind. Hmm. Well, that's enough. But you yeah. really don't remember any of the details of that night. Who did we kill? What was the guy's name that we killed? Uh, Brian, Slim. Yeah, Brian Slim was up on the stage uh, when yeah. you opened fire, and he, he took several slugs. You're pretty sure he's dead. I mean, you saw him go down. 
If I could remember, I, I he was good and dead. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's right. You were up on stage there for a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I shot near Lothatup in the head. That I can't remember. <laughs> exactly. All right. Hmm. All right. Well. well um, so as time uh, goes on, Kyle, you'll Marshall will start slowly remembering what happened that night. You're suffering from a sort of amnesia right now, which is actually a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say that's probably that's probably not bad news. One thing I will mention to everybody is say, hey, look, you know, as, as well, some of you guys did lose, we lost some key people here with their sanity. The fact that we destroyed a lot of these cultists uh, and this whole uh, monastery type location the meeting hall yeah the meeting hall i actually gained sanity i actually feel better uh so keep that in mind we might want to like that first place that we just went into the basement remember when we stole the necronomicon uh -huh. blow the place up the more we get rid of these cultists i think the better off mankind will be and the better we'll feel all right well let's uh Let's let's get back to the uh, the bungalow and and kind of hatch our next plan here. Okay. So you get back to the bungalow, and Ambassador to Dollarin is just kind of out cold on the sofa, heavily sedated by the doctor. And uh, I think that would probably be the next order of business. Like something's going to have to be done with the ambassador. Um, he's definitely. He's this yeah, I mean, a long -term thing. well, so, he did come out of it earlier this morning before he went to pick up Marshall at the hospital. Uh, but he's starts, he started, <coughs> you, you told him that you told him to like take a hot bath, right? And try to just calm down. And he came running out of the bathroom screaming about spiders uh, in the drains. And you had to sedate him again. Well, right. he may need some medical care. Yep. Um, okay, and, 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 and just give me, like, once we find out Jacob's exact state, you know, let me know that, because then I think it's going to be time for us to go take a look at the will. Yeah. And, and see what we need to do next there, according to... His All wishes. Right. Well, through some uh, family contacts and the Pinkertons as well, um, you're able to find out that his team of lawyers uh, is on the case. Um, you find out that there's uh, the the only r real hope for Jacob uh, to avoid any kind of capital punishment as a plea of insanity, and uh, you are assured by. Uh, by one of his lawyers, Sparky, that um, something happened uh, to Jacob where he he's not himself. Um, he is in the process of being diagnosed right now. Um, but actually, let me look here. Uh, Insane. Yeah, let's let's uh let's take a look, at Jacob, real quick. Oh, so, like. Serial killer traits. Those <laughs> he said he has. Yeah. Um, Sharp objects and paranoia. And the whole mind. Yeah, basically he's suffering from uh, severe xenophobia, which is a fear of foreigners and strangers. Um, they seem <laughs> they seem to think that his experiences in some of his experiences in the war are coming back to haunt him um, in a very powerful way. Um, and he also has an uh, an obsession with sharp and pointed objects. Um, and you know, as as they say, uh, he is not himself. Um, and he is being treated, um, but of course, he's going to you know, there's going to be a trial uh, for these nine murders, um, and they plan on just pleading insanity. 
Um, and he's probably going to be committed uh, to an asylum, a high security asylum. Okay. And they tell you that the matter of his will and everything, it's going to take a little time to iron out. Um, it could be several weeks uh, before all the paperwork and, you know, the, the, uh, the courts and everything, um, everything is going to be resolved as far as his will. It's going to be several weeks probably. All right. Well, we I think to bust him out, or we given up on him. I don't think there's any busting him out. He's insane. Yeah, and not only that, though, Tom. I mean, to bust him out of the state hospital would be, it would be a pretty serious undertaking. Uh, it's not worth it, man. You know, I, I say we wait till things cool down and his sanity possibly returns. You know, in the next five years, and then we think about getting him out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> and I'll tell you right now, it's probably not going to happen. He's or never, he's never at least, the same. <laughs> or, or, or at least stop by with a, uh, you know, yeah. cupcake once a year for his birthday or something. I don't know. Yeah, once all of this is, is said and done as far as his prosecution and internment into whatever hospital they wind up putting him in, you may be able to visit him, but it's going to be some time before uh, anything like that can happen. It's you know he's under very uh, he's under surveillance you know and you know they're trying to figure out what what happened to him. Um, and he killed nine people, you know. So it's a pretty serious matter. Right. If he'd only killed eight or seven, they well, might be able to well, brush that under the, the rug, but not nine. Right. <laughs> uh, hey, nine's a good number, man. Nine's a good number. It's odd and it's high. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the other and, people in the institution know not to mess with. True. The, uh, ambassador, uh, is similarly suffering, uh, from some severe phobias and manias. He, he's completely lost his mind. Talk about not being yourself. Um, he, uh, he wound up with, uh, and, and, Dr. Van Helsing being medically trained, maybe not necessarily as a psychi you know, psychologist or anything or psychiatrist. Uh, you have a feeling like that him screaming of spiders and shit like that. He has some kind of arachnophobia. Um, and he also has this thing where he's, he has this religious thing going on where he feels like uh, he's, he has this God complex for one thing. Um, and also just after briefly talking to him, when you first got back to the, uh, bungalow, um, he's suffering from something that perhaps you look up in a medical journal or something, just try to figure out it's called a blue, a bulo mania, which is a, uh, an inability to make decisions. He's having a lot of trouble, um, just making, you know, cognitive decisions about anything. Um, Sparky, yes, we got we got to commit this guy. Yeah, we've got to get him to. Uh, we've got to get him into an institution. Fortunately, since he's an ambassador, mm -hmm. he's probably got great benefits somewhere. Sure. <laughs> yeah. What's the so, best institution? So can around? we can we contact his his office, the ambassador's office? Yes. Now, now keep in mind, you know, he is a high-level official in the United States government. Um, you can be almost sure that if you guys involve yourself um, in, you know, turning him over or whatever, there's going to be some. There's going to be an inquiry. You know what I'm saying? Well, why don't why don't we do this, um, Doctor? Let's just uh, set him loose in front of a American embassy somewhere. <laughs> Push him in the right Windy direction and just drive, just drive away. Yeah, he's the Dork. British. He's the British ambassador. Just like, look, look, hell, it's it's the British embassy. I mean, seriously, yeah. Because I mean, it, otherwise we're going to be all kinds yeah. of hamstrung. I so agree. yeah, unfortunately, that's a, it's a, you know, Sparky does not feel good about doing this because you know he, he he does like the ambassador, but also realizing. Ding dong there's no dead. other there's there's no other good way to deal with this 
really horrible yeah. situation. So we, you know, we, we do it in, in the morning. So there's plenty of people around and, you know, kind of push them in the right direction. Like, okay. And then we drive away. <laughs> okay. This is almost the equivalent of like dropping somebody off at like the, you know, the, the nunnery or something, you know, yeah, yeah. the orphanage. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just unfortunate because, you know, you're, you're certain that if you guys were to become involved in this, that you'd have all kinds of government people asking you quite some very hard questions about what happened, you know? Um, and you know, you guys don't want to be detained or anything, do you? No, 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 not right no, now. No. Yeah. We've got so, to do. We have a sorry. world to save. Yeah. So you're just going to have to leave the ambassador to explain things himself, but, uh, he's probably going to wind up in the same place that Jacob is. It's the Manhattan state hospital, which it's a very large, um, government run facility for insane criminal that, types and things like that. Is that where pumpkin is? No, she is in the, uh, Brattleboro retreat down in Vermont. Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And, and she hasn't escaped yet, as far as we know. As far as you know. Yeah, she's in uh, Brattleboro, Vermont. Okay. Same place where Edgar Casey was. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, back to the bungalow. Right, Doctor? Well, well, there, was, there was also that one thing I wanted to try uh, with that cave in and the cleanup. Was mm -hmm. there any way, Sean, that I was use my credentials to help, uh, you know, with the, uh, you know, the, uh, my uh, coroner skills, help with the cleanup in the area, and, and to try to, like, sift through the rubble? And really, I want to gain access to that basement that's there underneath all the rubble. It's got, we got to get, there's something down there, guys. We got to go down to the basement. Right. But I, um, along with that, I, so I don't know if this has happened in a matter of a couple of days. I mean, let's, let's, I don't know how we could get by there without, you know, drawing attention. I'm sure that place is under a lot of scrutiny right now, right? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the only thing that's in the paper uh, about this place, there is a blurb like on page four um, of the post that mentions this look to the future business organization um their meeting hall burned down and there's you know, <laughs> ar arson is ex is suspected and the police are doing a uh, an investigation um, into this this meeting hall in uptown do they report a lot of death related to no. the arson or no they don't. No. Oh. It's not in the paper. Nope. There's just mm. kind of a blurb about a fire at, at this look to the future building. Wow. Fire. Fucking <laughs> cover up, baby. Um, Can we just do a, a, a drive by at like in a taxi cab just and take a look and see what's going on there? Okay. Um, you see the collapsed building, the meeting hall. It's entirely collapsed and it's it looks like it's all blackened looking like there was a fire uh, of some kind. Um, the annex building uh, sitting across the field and in the street over the, you know, you can see across this field with the annex building is still there. It's a two story sort of dormitory type building back there. But the, the meeting hall is completely leveled uh, just piles of blackened rubble. And it's been cordoned off. Uh, oh. Now, as, as we're driving by the, uh, you know, the, the ancillary building, or do we see, you know, the same Aryan mutants that were outside of it before? So no. Nope. Do we see any life, signs of life there? No, not really. Not as you're driving by. All of the windows are shuttered. No signs of, of life or movement or activity at the annex building. Hmm. Well, um, so it's still there, Tom. I don't know, man. Um, let's, uh, 
I, I mean, so we, we know what it looks like now. We know there could still be cultists there. I, I say we go back to the, the bungalow and just kind of like get our plan together if we're going to go over there or back to Boston or whatever we decide to do. Right. Okay. When you, um, get, back, when you get back to the bungalow, you, uh, Tom, you receive a telegram by courier, by Pinkerton courier, a private courier. And you receive a letter from Ben Knuckles, uh, or, or a telegram, I should say, from Ben Knuckles, who was the Pinkerton agent that Jacob had hired in Boston, um, saying that there's a, a gentleman uh, by the name of Alessio Savastano. Sa Savastano? Is that right? Savastano? Yeah, Savastano. Mm -hmm. um, who claims to uh, to know about the order. And he is seeking out uh, Marshall Sparks <coughs> and uh, and Doctor and you, Doctor Van Helsing, and Ben Knuckles would like to arrange a meeting um, with this uh, Savastano guy. Mm. He what says that. About? Well, it says in the telegram that he has been fully vetted, and that he's quite certain that uh, there there's no danger uh, in meeting this guy. Um, apparently, he has information. Um, having to having to do with the uh, the lodge in Boston and the order. Ooh. Oh well, uh, we're very interested in meeting him. Then let's uh, let's make it happen. Can we get a a message Call to him, him to come yeah. come by, or or we can go find him and bring him to the or bungalow? Do we, or do we go back to Boston? Well, well, is he in Boston or New York? No, it's, he's in New York. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, they the meeting has been arranged. Um, well, well, first he asked, you know, if you you know if you if you want to meet him, you know, just send me a a reply, you know, by telegram. Okay, we do. Okay. Yep. And later that day, you receive another telegram uh, saying that the meeting has been arranged. Um. At uh, the Augustine. Catholic Church, uh, downtown Manhattan. Hmm. Okay. The other thing that occurs to me, like, weren't we, wasn't Jacob having his boat delivered or yes. something like that? Yes. Um, and yeah, and you, that's something actually you, you could probably find out through his lawyers. Um, yes. Uh, Jacob's, uh, yacht, his commuter yacht. Um, has arrived in Manhattan. Um, okay. And, his, and if you, and if you like, you know, the the lawyers are willing to arrange uh, for you to to uh, take possession of it if you like. This this is something that uh, you know, that they can do with rel relative ease. You being the, uh, you know, the beneficiary of the will. Um. As soon as things get worked out. <laughs> well, no, no, they they can they can give you possession of, of the yacht. It's just the the money, all of the cash and assets, all of his stocks and bonds and all that kind of stuff is going to be tied up for a little while. All right. Well, we've got the yacht. But yeah, if you inquire about the yacht, they say that you know it's no problem. We we can, uh, you know, we can uh, transfer the deed title or whatever. Uh, we can transfer the title over to to you immediately. Excellent. Let's make that happen. And, um, uh, doctor, after we, uh, meet with the Savastano gent, maybe we should relocate from the bungalow to the yacht. I like it. How big is this shot? It's badass, man. It is badass. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> can it travel across the ocean? No. No, it's it's more of a coastal vessel, okay. um, but it is a uh, let's see specifics of the yacht. Do, 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 do. Does it come with a captain? <laughs> no. 
Oh, come on. It's a 60 foot Garwood commuter yacht. 60 foot. 60 foot. Jesus. You oh, could almost cross the ocean in that thing. 60 but, feet. Yeah. You know, but it's not necessarily, you know, seaworthy. <laughs> you could try your luck, but uh, you, gotta, you guys got to remember, like, you know, back in the 1920s, uh, you go out into the ocean in a 60 foot yacht. You know, it's uh, that's right. We don't have radar and all that. It's true. Yeah, I mean, it, it, unless you really, really know what you're doing. Um, but basically, this this yacht, you know, it's a luxury yacht, uh, built for for speed. You know, got crazy engines in it, man. Yeah, it's got four 12 cylinder Liberty engines in it, which are <laughs> which are actually aircraft engines. They're airplane engines. Um, four of them, four 12 cylinder engines, four 12 cylinders. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, by 1920 standards, I mean, you know, we're not talking about like, super, you know, high horsepower sure. engines or anything, but yeah, it, it'll move. It'll get you to where you're going for sure. Um, sparks, Sparky will, um, put a feeler out to uh, Stuart Devlin. Um, Remembering that he was familiar with Jacob mm -hmm. and Yusufus and the adventure down in the pits of Bendal the Loom and okay. ask him if he'd like to pick up some, some work. Yeah. You have an address for him in Havana, Cuba. Um, so right. your, your best bet would probably just send a telegram or a letter. That's what we'll do. Okay. Yep. Yeah. We'll okay. say, um, you I'll know, that. I will make a note of that. What are you saying, basically, in the telegram? Well, we've um, heard tell of his uh, abilities as a pilot of a ship, and also that he's familiar with uh, some of the scenarios that we might be running into, and we'd like to uh, secure him for some light work, okay. you know, driving this 60-foot yacht. All right, we'll see if you get a reply. Sounds good. Actually, uh, you do get a reply within 24 hours. Um, and uh, it's uh, from a man who claims to be uh, a friend of his or a business associate. And he lets you know in the telegram that uh, Stuart Devlin uh, left Havana uh about 10 days ago uh, heading to Boston. Mm. Oh, really? Yeah. They... Wow. So I don't know if Marshall would, would know this. Um, Jacob certainly would. But Yusufus actually sent him... Uh, he, tr he made a phone call, I believe, uh, trying to get a hold of Stu Stuart Devlin. And this was... Oh... In the middle of last month sometime I think it was around yeah around the middle of June it's getting late July now it's like July 30th around the middle of June Yusuf has tried to contact Stuart Devlin in a, in a bout of madness <laughs> um well Try, trying to recruit him to go back down to the Honduras to, to pick up to find Percy Fawcett remember Oh yeah, that's right. Well, um, we, uh, doctor, I think we can handle this one of two ways. If he's on his way to Boston, we could, um, reach out to the Pinkertons to keep an eye out for him, or we could take an ad out in the paper, um, for a, uh, you know, the riverboat captain kind of like specific to Honduras and then see if he shows up for that. One of those two methods might work. I like the first one. The, the so you like the, the Pinkertons? Yeah, the, 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 the newspaper article, I'm afraid others might be reading it and track us okay. down somehow. I don't know. So so I'll, I'll um, send a telegram to Ben Knuckles and just tell him, like, look, Stuart Devlin, we give him the description. He's headed to Boston. 
and uh, we we need him, and we also need you to keep him safe too because he doesn't know all the stuff that's happened. We don't think so. Okay. We'll if see they can if... find him, send him send him to us. Yeah, if anybody can find him, the Pinkertons will. All right, they'll do that for you. Okay. Um. All right. Well, uh, to the church, shall we? Amen. Yes. Yes, this is the Church of the Blessed Sacrament in downtown Manhattan. Oh, and Sean, I didn't ask this, but like when I was released from, was I missing my trusty trench club and my yes. pistol? Yep, you were. Okay, you were. we gotta we gotta replace that shit. But to the church first. Okay. Um, I, I think if I'm not mistaken. There are some firearms in the safe. Okay. Is there a, uh, you know, the sidearm I prefer is the, uh, the 1911. So are one of those hanging around in there? Sure. Look at what All else right. is in there. Let's see. Uh, Ooh, up. A now three ounce bottle of cocaine. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. I'll leave that to the doctor's good hands. Yeah. What about the ambassador's weapons? I mean, his weapons, they were in the truck with us on the way back. What did he have? Yeah. Oh, that's right. You got, that's actually, you guys had a bunch of guns in the back of that truck, didn't you? Yep. Yeah. There was a, an elephant gun. Uh, there's the air rifle that you guys had. Um, I believe the ambassador had, let's see. The ambassador has a uh, 30 caliber lever action carbine, uh, a 45 Martin Henry rifle, sawed off 12 gauge or 10 gauge, a 38 revolver. All right. Well, um, that's good see. stuff. Yeah, those are good. Um, well, I'll, I'll just get the pistol for now. And then um, on our way, we'll stop by a sporting goods store, and I'll I'll uh, I'll get a baseball bat. Okay. And then we'll stop by a hardware store, and I'll get some like nasty. Um, I'll get a claw hammer and a uh, and a and a bunch of like nine inch nails, and and I'll just uh, drive those through the top of the baseball bat. So I got you know like kind of a makeshift trench weapon in case I need it. Just have that yeah. in the trunk. Yes, yeah, Sparky knows what he's doing. Escape from New York style. I like it. All right. <laughs> All right. Cool. Uh, so we get to the church. Haven't been to one of these in a while. Ha ha ha. Yeah. So you get to the church and uh, it's pretty empty. It's like, you know, kind of mid morning. It's very large uh, church, large building. And you guys go in, they've all these pews are lined up, you know, and there's the, the this huge altar with all these statues and artwork and stuff. And you see a, a lone man sitting in the first row of pews up in the front near the altar. Um, Lee, would you like to describe yourself? Yeah, you guys can look at the picture. Um, so he's... Large imposing figure. He's dressed in a fine suit. Okay. Is the doctor Smoking wearing like a, a lab coat at all times? Italian oh. in appearance. I hope not. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think the thing is, is you're, you're imposing, but now you got to deal with Dr. Van Helsing. <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, all right. Well, no, I'm in civilian with character. Mm -hmm. Here we go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh oh. Well, I hope he's not walking, running around in a lab coat all the time. That's that's just that wouldn't be right. Disconcerting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jeez, here we go. Um. So we'll uh, we'll walk up to um, who we think is Alessio. And I'll offer my hand. I'm like, uh, Mr. Savastano, I assume. 
Uh, yes. Are uh, you the gentlemen that are here to meet? Yes. Pleasure to meet you, Marshall Sparks. You can call me Sparky. He says this in kind of good... he says in kind of broken English. He's got like a heavy Italian accent, you know. And this is the good Doctor Nicholas von Helsing. A pleasure. Uh, very, very good to meet. Very good to meet. Um, here, let's sit down. Oh, I have a uh, I have good friend. Look at these letters he provide. So I pull out the letters. They're in the uh, they're the Hancock. These are the right. Hancock letters. Right. So here's kind of the lowdown on this. Um. After and we'll get to the letters here in a second. I'll go over them with you. But you find out that the Savastano guy has been sent uh, by a man uh, named Torrance Garby, um, who he explains goes by Jacob is his middle name, to his family, who has an uncle uh, who is a uh, an archaeologist. He's been doing uh, a lot of work in Africa and such, and he's he's pretty famous for for some of his work. Uh, but he was taking a rest. Uh, in Canich, Scotland. And that rings a bell uh, with you guys because you guys found a letter um, down in the uh, the inner sanctum of the lodge, went mm -hmm. down in the caves and shit. You guys found a letter from a Duncan McBain in Canich, Scotland to Carl Stanford. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so when you find out that this Henry Hancock who's been basically taking a, sort of a vacation in Canich, Scotland, that kind of rings a bell to you guys. Um, so let's, let's look at, uh, Hancock letter one. This is dated May 12th, 1924, which was, uh, a couple months ago, almost three months ago. And it says, dear Jacob, my greetings to you, Jacob, and fondest regards to your father. I hope to join you this fall. If they capital T do not find me before I am able to leave Scotland. I realize that neither you nor your father have ever believed any of the strange legends which I have, I have related to you, but I can turn to no one else. If my life is of any value to you, please look into this matter for me. I am in desperate need of an artifact, which I believe may be found in a museum at Mes Miskatonic University, Arkham, Massachusetts. The object is a small grayish green stone shaped like a five pointed star. I had hoped to find one at the dig but I fear that work there is not going fast enough and that they will get their supernatural aid before I find the star stone. Please make every effort to obtain the star stone, but if word should reach you that something has happened to me, obtain the star stone for yourself, for they will be on your trail soon. Mm. And uh, it says your uncle, Henry Hancock. And there's a note at the bottom, a hand, a hand uh, written note uh, from Jacob Garibay saying that his father died 10 years ago. And the reference to his father is a code between his uncle Henry and himself indicating authenticity of the message and urgency. Mm. Mm. Letter two, it's only dated with, within the same week, 1924. Hancock House, Canich, Scotland. <clears throat> Hold on. <coughs> says, uh, Dear Jacob, I fear that this message will be the last you get from me for some time. Unless I flee this area, the sons of Yogg-Sothoth will be upon me. So that also rings a bell, you guys. <laughs> Lorne, well, the sons of Yogg-Sothoth, that was one of the secret orders of, uh, one of the secret ranks of the Order yes. of the Silver Twilight. Lorne discovered Lorne discovered that Belphegor is the, a leader of the group, and he fears that they are aware of our discoveries. Margaret brought me a star stone, but try to find more, for I need all I can get. The first piece was stolen from the dig site last night, but they did not get the second piece. I have it well hidden now, and they will not get it from me. We do not know what they want the pieces for, but we think there are three altogether. Adam disappeared today. He stopped by yesterday evening, but this morning, Fergus says Adam checked out and left late last night. Adam, being afraid of the dark since the African episode last year, 
would not have left at night, and I fear that he has run afoul of Belphegor's people. Lorne does not know about Adam's disappearance yet, and I fear that telling him would be too much for the old man. All of these problems started with the arrival of the French woman. I will confront her in the morning. Make sure that you obtain a star stone for yourself as soon as possible and keep it with you always. Give my greetings to your father, your uncle Henry Hancock. Again, the reference to his father, which is code for, um, you know, being a legitimate letter from his uncle. Letter three is a little different. Henry Hancock, Hancock House, Kennett, Scotland, 16 May 1924. My dearest Jacob, all of my fears have proved to be unfounded. If my yeah, letters, if my letters of late have seemed to indicate trouble, I hope that you'll forgive me. I realized that my imagination had run wild. There never was any danger. Adam and I are going to head back to Africa in the morning and we'll be out of touch for some time, but there is no cause for alarm. We can take care of ourselves. We stumbled across an amazing find, but must recheck our previous work. Give my greetings to the rest of the family. With fondest mm -hmm. regards, Henry Hancock. Um, and, just, and just a couple of, um, I think I have something here too. Jacob writes at the bottom of the second letter. Um, he says, I do not recognize the sons of Yogg-Sothoth, nor does Belphegor or the French woman make any sense to me. Um, and he notes at the bottom of the third letter, says, this letter is not really from my Uncle Henry. My concern for my uncle's safety is based on the obvious falseness of this letter. For Adam, his assistant, um, was frightened by something they discovered in Africa and could not be persuaded to return to the continent, let alone to their dig site there. Um, the other names mentioned... Um, he, he doesn't know either, like the mention of the French woman. He has no idea who this person is. Um, he does say that this man named Lorne is, uh, I believe Lorne was a friend of his in Canich. Give me one second here. Yes, uh, Jacob notes on, on here that uh, Lorne, he's referring to Dr. Lorne McParlin, um, who is the local doctor in Canich, Scotland, um, and an acquaintance or friend of his Uncle Henry's. Um, well. And he says in the letter that Lorne, or, or Dr. McParlin, is the one who discovered that Belphegor is a leader of the group. And he fears that they are aware of our discoveries. He has no idea what his uncle found or what they were doing in Scotland. All he knew is, is that he was kind of taking a vacation there, uh, you know, when he got these letters. So, basically, what's happening? Idea, does he have any idea where this thing was hidden? He said hmm. there's pieces, and he found he's got one of them well hidden. All he knows is what his uncle said in the letters. Well, the the star symbol, Sparky's like that looks like uh, it looks like the shield we have with the the that sounds like that symbol that we've got, the one I've been trying to learn. Yeah, it yeah, sounds like it sounds like he could be referring to something like that. Yeah. But this is the shape of a stone or something? He just calls it a star stone. Star. That's an elder sign, for sure, man. Yeah, what yeah. does he say? He says, please make every effort to obtain the star stone. He says, I'm needing an artifact. And he said he thinks that it can be found in a museum at the Miskatonic University in Arkham. He says he describes it as a small grayish green stone shaped like a five-pointed star. Well, we could head to Miskatonic and take a look. Yep, definitely. So I don't know. Um, so Alessio. essentially, so what's what's happened here is Alessio, or if you just want to tell him that you know you've been basically sent here to find these guys to. Yeah, I'm here. Apparently, to help. Jacob had learned of your exploits in Boston, um, 
and thought that maybe you guys had been dealing with some of the same people that uh, seemed to be running amok in Canada, Scotland, having to do with his uncle. So he sent this fine gentleman. Uh, I, owe the, I owe the family a debt, so I pay. I pay. I'm here to help. Mm -hmm. Well, we could certainly use help. Very good with my hands. What do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a tailor. Suit. Tailor. Could you make me a, a, a shirt with a razor in the cuff? Oh, yes. Absolutely. No problem. Excellent. Well, you need, you, need, you need no clothes. Both of you need no clothes. You're dressed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're looking a little shabby these days. Well, sure. we, I fix you up. No problem. Okay. Well, Alessio, if you would um, come with us, we're going to uh, collect our gear from the bungalow and relocate to the yacht. Yes, I do you speak Greek? No, just a little English and uh, good Italian. Very okay. good Italian. Good w working on English. Yeah, he speaks English well enough. Uh, you, don't ha you don't have to do the accent all the time if you don't want to, Lee. I'll I'll grab the uh I'll grab the uh the wardrobe. Okay. Here. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you have it in a car with you outside. You know, you have a car waiting for you. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Well, we'll uh, we'll go collect our our gear and get to the yacht, and then now we have some decisions to make. So we'll as we're you know driving, and Alicia, I'm assuming you're coming with us, right? with you okay so you're with us so we'll Pass. start telling him the tale of the silver twilight the uh -huh. the burning down of homes the the weird cults the probably we're, we're not gonna you know we'll allude to the same strange occurrences but not get into details sure <clears throat> And, you know, up until, you know, the, the current, you know, the present, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, to, to Alessio, when he hears some of the stuff, it, it would probably occur to him that it seems like they are talking about some kind of uh, secret society, mm -hmm. uh, you know, perhaps having to, you know, of course, well, obviously having to do with the occult, um, you know, and, and your friend Jacob Garby, you know, of course, told you that this is probably what's happening because um you know his grandfather or his uncle um uh, was kind of into the occult as well um and he had a feeling that it had something to do with you know some kind of occult activity so it so, doesn't, uh, it doesn't really surprise yeah. you so alessio makes the sign of the cross and says That sounds that sounds good, but they've they've also been finding us too. So it's good to uh, always be on guard. All right, so you guys get back to the bungalow out there in Long Island and collect your stuff. Um, you have this uh, humongous safe, by the way. It's probably like a you know six hundred pound safe that you managed to uh, load up into the pickup. And uh, Jacob's boat uh, is, you know, docked down there in the Hudson River, Manhattan. You've got an address. All right, so we'll, we'll head down there. And have I been on this boat before? Yes, you have. Does there, is there a safe on the boat? Yes, a small safe. Well, I guess I can't hold all this. All right, we're going to have to bring this on the yacht. Yep. Yeah, yeah. you're definitely going to need a hand truck. Uh, I'm assuming that you have one. 
There's yeah, we've we we definitely have one for the uh, the truck because otherwise, how the hell have we been getting it on and off, anyways? Well, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we'll hand truck that sucker onto Ale- the boat. Alessio helps. Oh, it's uh, let's see what's 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 Alessio's strength here. Oh, it's a lot easier with Alessio around. Thank it God. Is, it is. It turns out to be a lot easier uh, with this big <laughs> Italian guy. Um, Alessio, okay. I already love having you around. Oh, strong, yes. Strong as an ox. Okay. No problem. I can see like Alessio just kind of rolls up his sleeves, you know. <clears throat> with a cigar. He's got the cigar, cigar hanging out of his mouth. One thing that I wanted to mention that I mentioned meant to mention at the beginning of the session, and Tom, this will be good news to you. I'm going to to change the uh, reading rules just a bit. When you read a mythos tome, when you first, you know how you uh, the first thing you do is you, you usually skim it. Um, it can take you know several days usually, depending on the size of the book, or the language or whatever. But when you're done skimming it, it's an, sort of an initial reading of the book just skimming it after you do that um you'll get a small amount of sanity loss usually which i believe you took from the books that you've skimmed i believe right. dr van helsing skimmed both nameless cults and the necronomicon uh the necronomicon with the help of the ambassador of course but once you've skimmed the book um and learn what kind of incantations or spells or whatever in it, you can actually begin studying those spells without having read the book to spend, you know, spending all of that time to fully read the book to learn the spells. You can focus, oh. you can begin focusing solely on learning uh, spells within the book. Uh, oh. Given that, given that you know the language that it's written in, of course. Right, right, right. Um, so, if you like, since you have skimmed Nameless Cults, um, you could begin trying to study some of the uh, spells that are written in that book. Um, and I believe, just real quickly here, uh, there's just a handful of them in there. Uh, call forth the woodland goddess, command the trees, contact brother, and I'll show it to you here, contact brother, command airy travelers, which includes the enchant whistle spell, and call forth that which should not be. <laughs> well, probably don't want to do that one. Uh, what do you guys think? Pro- probably not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I don't think Marshall at this point has skimmed any of these books yet either. Didn't we all learn Command Airy Traveler, though? Mm, I think yeah, maybe I th- did. I think, yeah, I think uh, Jacob taught it to you. That's how you learned it. Yes. That. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think we all. We yeah, you guys have know that. that one. And we have the whistle. <clears throat> no. You do. Awesome. Um, so I just want to let you guys know that just for future reference. Unfortunately, uh, since no one's able to read Greek, you're kind of stuck on the whole Necronomicon thing. You were in the process of uh, fully reading that book when the ambassador went mad. Mm. And, and I think Tom, just, Tom, uh, you mentioned somewhere in Discord, like you know, can I get like a research assistant or something to help me read it or whatever? That's up right. to you. Uh, you know, uh, it is it is the Necronomicon. Um, you're gonna want to be very careful with uh, with who knows that you have that for one thing. Um, but that is a route you could take. I mean, you could if you could find somebody you trust who knows Greek. Of course, you could. Uh, begins making some progress on that. I think but. you'd probably be better off learning Greek first. <laughs> right. How long does that take? Uh, we uh, buy him a Rosetta Stone. Now here it goes <laughs> fast. Uh, quite a while, I imagine. Like, quite a while. Yeah. Uh, does my daughter have any friends? Back from school? Um, Probably... I don't know. I mean, how it depends on how trusting you want to be, Tom. Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, your daughter's friends. To, to kind of take something like that, you know, the Necronomicon in, in Greek, uh, kind of out of the uh, out of the sort of circle of the group, 
and say, hey, so I've got this really cool book and I want well, to they'll, how- they'll actually have to read it, Tom, which means they'll Exactly. Shattering, you'll be shattering some young mind. <laughs> that, that's kind of what I'm saying. In order for them to either translate it for you um, or to sort of have sessions and, you know, do a translation with you present, whoever this person is would have to read the Necronomicon as well. Um, so, yeah, if you do that, then I'll just go ahead and declare you uh, Ash versus Evil Dead because that's what he would do. Exactly. I find yeah, some, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I so find you, some rando and just bring her in. Come on. So just ponder that. If you can find someone who reads Greek, you've already skimmed it with the ambassador. So if you were able to find someone who's trustworthy enough, um, you could begin studying some of the spells and incantations out of that book immediately. Okay. All right. All right. Keep that in mind. In the meantime, yeah. what's these spells here? Do you guys think we should, uh, or I should start looking at command the trees? Uh, this is a great question. And we um, already got command aerial travelers. Call forth the woodland goddess. I mean, of course, one, uh, uh, of course, good. Alessio, you'd be kind of wondering what the hell's in this big ass safe that they have. You know, uh, you guys get it out of the boat, and they, you guys are chilling on the yacht now. It's it's a it's lavish, dude. It's all mahogany and it's all gassed up. Po- everything's polished. Ready to Alessio, go. Alessio likes his new friends. Yeah. <laughs> He's like impressed. He's like, hmm. Yeah. So these guys have money. have money. These fuckers have money. I put a bunch of Coke on the, uh, on the table there and I cut up a bunch of lines. <laughs> 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 Uh, doctor. Well, Alessio, I'm sorry to cut you off, Kyle, but Alessio might also be wondering about the baseball bat with nails driven through it. <laughs> you know, maybe a little bit. Oh, well, uh, you know, if he asks yeah. me about it, I'll tell him. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, he's like, oh, I see you have your uh... personal personal protection. I uh, I served, and this was my uh, weapon of preference. So, you know. Oh, you're a veteran. Oh, yeah. And then I look down at the table and say, personal protection. I do a big line, and I hand him a dollar bill, see if he wants any. Uh, you know, while you're handing the bill around, I'm going to say, <clears throat> doctor, now that your mind's clear, and I know you need your clarity powder, <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's. Uh, I would recommend Command the Trees. Call forth the Woodland Goddess. Sounds like bringing forth the fucking dark child again or something. Um, okay. I, I don't know for sure, but command the trees sounds a little more, you know, like, Hey, you can command the trees. Yeah. I got it. Yeah, you know, I agree. <laughs> as a poor, right. and it, it is opposed to like call forth that, which should not be. No, yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't really like call forth and call forth. Anything sound sketchy control yeah. sounds better. Yeah, I agree. All right. That's what I'm going to study. Uh, Sean, Okay. Command the trees. Okay, cool. Um, let me roll something for that. Yeah, Alessio will do a... doesn't get crazy like the doctor, but he'll do a little. Just to see how good it is. Okay. Oh, it's the best. Is oh, it yeah, good? This, this is... is uh, yeah. This, this is corner quality cocaine. Well, mm-hmm. now he's really... Now he's really impressed. <laughs> yeah, Seriously, like, he's like, like, "Oh, oh, pharmaceutical damn. grade." Yeah. Like, okay. All right. Command the trees, Van Helsing. Four weeks. Okay. And this is assuming that you don't get wrapped up in uh, anything too serious within the next four weeks, and assuming that you study a little bit each day, you know. Okay. And I could uh, note, I could, I could rules. note as well, like the, uh, uh, what does one call forth that which should not be? Um, you do notice, uh, just kind of upon perusing nameless cults, that the incantation requires access to um, underground caves or tunnels in order to cast that spell. Oh, oh my! Yeah, that yeah, yuck. The deeper, the better. It says. Oh my! So Sean, while we're uh, while we're hanging out, I'll uh. 
I'll go over to my wardrobe and I'll show these guys that I have different disguises. No. Guys. Cool. Like, uh, like, what are your, some of your disguises? Please say hunchback. No, not nothing that elaborate. More <laughs> like, uh, you know, priest, Swedish fisherman, workman, aristocrat, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Monkey handler. Yeah. Um. <laughs> in the back, I've got uh, a little compartment. A Thompson machine gun back there with rounds. Ah, oh. nice. He's even got a drum a drum magazine for it. So, gentlemen, we have some decisions to make here besides just our book reading and refreshments here. Um, do we want to go back to the look to the future site? Do we want to head back to Boston and um, maybe throw some dynamite through the Order of the Silver Twilight's windows? Uh, or do we want to start heading towards Scotland? What about Arkham to get that uh, stone? Yeah. And, so maybe we could stop. Is Well, is Arkham on the way to Boston or is it past Boston? Um, Arkham is, is north of New York, up in Massachusetts. It's like a day trip. Where, where is it in relation to Boston, though? Uh, it's inland. Okay. So, so we could... <laughs> about 100 miles inland, I believe. That's that's kind of perfect. So we can go there first, see what's up, down, okay. and, and then we can head, you know, back. Want to, um, you know, Alessio is, you know, who who is? We do we have targets in Boston? That's who. Who who's who? We so we obviously. Do have, I mean, we tell them about Carl Stanford and, you know, uh, the gentleman there, but they're very hard to find. You know, I think more than anything else, Alessio, what what we've decided on as a campaign to try to take these guys out if we can find them, but more than anything else, disrupt their enterprise. Yeah. There's a Carl Stanford, John Scott, Barry Pollard, just a few. He's, he asked you, do you know, do you know where any of these men live? Well, we think they're on the move a lot. You do, you do know that Barry Pollard has we, a place at Margie's Tea House. We do, yeah, we do, we do know that. Oh, that's... but as far as Stanford and Scott, you don't know if they have a private residence or not. And we think they might be masters of disguise as well. We think that uh, <clears throat> some of these guys may be the same person. We knew of that cab in Vermont, but I think we blew it up. You have powerful enemies. Yeah. Right, right. The lake house in Vermont. Yep. Um, yeah, you guys burned that down. I believe you set it aflame as you yeah. left. Yeah, that was uh, Sparks' first encounter with the group. Yes, the Vengeance Bear. The Vengeance Bear. Does this Pollard know any of you? He doesn't know me. In fact, I'm not sure that. Well, I guess they do kind of know me now, but yeah, I don't think they've ever met you personally. But no, they definitely know Van Helsing. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be the only one that they really know, and recognize, or, or at least for uh, personally. Yeah, you're right. True. Well, it sounds like maybe you, you guys are planning to take some type of parting shot, and then. Hit, hit that hit out to Europe. So, yeah, I think they're I think saying they have some unfinished business in Boston. Yep. Well, let's go to Arkham. Go to that university. Hey, Sean, let, let, 
did the uh, did the expedition happen to Antarctica from the Mountains of Madness? The story. No. Is that hit the paper. Okay. No. All right. I think that's a few years into the future. Okay. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's 1929. I forget it. I think so. Do we have any? Do you do you guys have any contacts at this university? Loosely. Did any of your clan have any acts? Jacob, here. Yeah, um, Jacob specifically. He, um, Jacob had met uh, Henry Armitage, the library, the librarian, um, curator of the museum. Mm. But no, I I think these guys just have really kind of loose connections to Armitage. Um, or uh, also John Farnsworth. Uh, I guess Sparky could use his relationship with Jacob. Yeah. Current situation. Possibly. Be like, this is charming, this charming self. Yeah, the Hancock letter specifically mentions that these the star stone is in the museum itself. I need to take a piss. I'll be right back. All right, that sounds good. I'm going to do the same. <laughs> I will do the same. All right. Oh, and guys, I'm back. Uh, are we going to want to go into the basement of this place that we took down? Is that on our agenda? Yeah, I mean, you guys just got kind of a cursory look at the uh, site. You guys just drove by, you know. Were there cops all around it, or is this cordoned off? It was just cordoned off. So, yeah, we could probably sneak in there at night. I don't think they're back yet. Where's Alex tonight, Sean? Oh, I forgot. Yeah, you signed on after I told these guys. Alex got a new job. Um, he's been in training. He's doing some phone work for like a customer service company. Okay. And he, he's going to take a little hiatus from the group for a while while he does this training thing. Um, okay. I think at some point he'll, he'll come back and join us. But right now, getting up early in the morning and stuff, he's just kind of exhausted. So, Got it. Got it. But uh, I think I think he'll be back before too long. Once okay. He gets, once he gets Is that settled. In. Terrence Garby. Yes. Okay, got it. Yeah, he rolled up. Uh, he he is a spy, or no? Okay. He put fed. He put federal agent, but I thought he was a spy. I think he must have changed it. Um, but he is. His middle name is Jacob. He is actually Jacob, who is Henry Hancock's uh, nephew. Okay. That's what's getting his character basically is the, <laughs> the impetus for getting you guys involved uh, with what the order may be doing in Scotland right now. And, you know, it kind of it ties in with the hint that you guys got from that Carl Stanford letter. You know, something's right. going on over there. Um, as a matter of fact, let's look at that real quick. It's, uh, I might as well. Um, Yeah, it's the letter from Duncan McBain. Let's look at this for a moment. 
Greetings and felicitations. Miss Shantrain has advised me of your recent successes and informed me of the item you require. I fear that it will be some time before I find it, as there are two Americans digging at what I believe to be the site of the temple. Uh-oh. That's those guys. Could those two Americans be... Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yep. Could this Miss Chantrain be the French woman? I was gonna, that's what I was just going to say. Do I detect a French accent in this uh, letter? Well, Chantrain is definitely a French. You know, Chantrain is definitely a French name. Okay. All right, it's all coming together. Mm. Recommend that I journey to the name of the city. Studies with the serpent people progress most satisfactorily. Then there's all those other hints. Order of the Templars of the Orient, German colleagues. It's going to go on and on. Yeah, it looks like they're trying to recruit new members yep. from other organizations. I even mentioned Crowley. Mm hmm. It says, I understand that Mr. Scott is in charge of the project in your area. Please extend my greetings to him. I have not seen him since before the Great War. These guys are all buddy buddy. Duncan mm -hmm. McBain. This is January of this year when this letter was written. Well, <sighs> mark a few days off the calendar. It is now first week of August, 1924. You guys started back in April in Boston. Been a busy four months. Yes, it has. All right, gentlemen. Well, um, what should we do with the uh, the yacht? If we're going to drive, I guess we're heading, we're going to drive up to Miskatonic and then back to Boston. Just leave it here. So it would make more sense to act to Boston make more sense yeah okay well then we got to get a, a you know somebody to pilot it because we uh we don't have that skill nobody does uh, I don't think so I know I don't I think you so fisted dear. but he's kind of dead so that's not very helpful what's the and skill called I've got pilot airplane at 15%. Did Knuckles ever find that guy? Well, it's only been a week, so maybe. No, it hasn't even been that. It's only been like a day or two. I mean, I'm sure we can get somebody to captain it from... Sure. New York City to Boston, so we'll... I mean, <clears throat> Marshall would probably know somebody in the in the area, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, really, piloting a, a ship, you know, is a, is a one percent kind of a thing. Your I nephew, mean, the BB Crown and Shield, he would know a good was him, and he could probably recommend someone. Yeah, BB's probably vacationing in the Orient or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. True. Uh, well, somebody somebody delivered and piloted it here. Yeah, it was brought over by steamer. Okay, absolutely. For a very hefty sum. I mean, you guys could take your chances, you know, and then maybe just kind of tool around in the harbor a little bit with it and uh, take it slow. It's up to you guys, or you could try to, you know, find a charter captain. Uh, to pilot it up to Boston for you. Charter captain, definitely, man. Yeah, charter captain it is. Yeah, I don't want to sink this thing. Then we're going to be scuba diving for our books. We don't, we don't, yeah, we don't play with amateurs. Okay. Try to find someone reputable, man. 
But still, wait. Are, but before we do that, are we going to drive up to the Mastonic University and get the well, stone? You might well, as well. Yeah, the Miskatonic is like a you know a half day's drive from Boston. Well, we might as well get that stone, guys. Yeah, for sure. But we might as well get the boat up to Boston, right? So it's right there, and then we just drive, and then we're right back to the boat instead of leaving oh, the I'm... boat here. Okay, I see. You go to Boston, Massachusetts, and then drive in from Boston. Got it. Yeah, we might as well, we might as well have the boat close, right? So, got it. Pick it up Got to the it. Boston and dock it there, and then we can jump in a car. And sh- the stuff's right there, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you guys are able to track down that afternoon. You're able to track down a. Uh, uh, he seems to have a trustworthy uh, charter captain by the name of Alvin McLeary. Um, he's an older gentleman, and uh, he's willing to, to <coughs> he's willing to do it for you. Um, I just should should warn you guys, you know, to keep any kind of uh, anything incriminating or strange uh, tucked away in the uh, the holds on this journey. Uh, we, we don't want Captain McLeary to get suspicious now do we what, what do we have on us that's uh all Alessio's, yeah all Alessio stuff that's not concealed is in his uh wardrobe you know yeah yeah. Away. Yeah, yeah. Every, uh, yeah everything's put away <clears throat> right um but he agrees to do it for you and it'll it, it'll basically take you know a whole day uh to tool up the coast uh up to boston uh but it's not a problem Okay. You know, All right, fantastic. You know, he wants like uh, $40 cash uh, before you guys leave, and then he wants another 40 when you arrive. Thanks, sir. Um, right. He says, you know, of course, we're going to have to stop for gasoline a couple times on the way. <laughs> yeah, because. <laughs> yeah, because. <laughs> It's just the thing's just eating through dinosaurs. It does. Yes, it does indeed. Just imagine the carburetor set, the the, the intake manifold on those things, man. Right. All right, so we're back in Boston. Let's get a Lestio out here. All right, so uh, Van Helsing and Spar- and Sparky, it's good to be back in Boston. It's been a little while. Of course, Van Helsing is probably wondering what's going on, you know, uh, down at the city hospital. You know, where you- yeah, where you- I check in. Yeah, well, they they have your assistant covering things, um, and all the paperwork has gone through. Um, you know, so for as long as you need to take your sabbatical uh, for your daughter, uh, it's fine. Okay. Every, everything seems to be going just fine down down at the office. All right, good, good. Wow. All right. Well, uh, we will take a drive to Miskatonic. Okay. All right, so you drive out into the boondocks. Sean, um, I'll, uh, I'll I'll take the uh, I'll take the Thompson and conceal it in the trunk. Okay. The uh, with the fifty round and a, the thirty round with the. Okay, and you're leaving everything else on the yacht. Yeah. Pretty much. And just taking your personal effects. Put on my character sheet. Couple shotguns, couple handguns, uh, modified baseball bat. I'm leaving. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna take my, uh, the pistol and the modified baseball bat with me. You know, but uh, the pistol's gonna be on me. The bat's gonna be in the car. Jar of cocaine. Yep. Sawed off shotgun. Six sticks of dynamite strapped inside my coat. All right. So you guys get up to Arkham. Um, and none of you have actually ever been here. And uh, you get to the the university, um, Miskatonic University campus, um, and pull up in front of the museum. And uh, 
when you're looking around inside the museum, they, they have some pretty cool stuff in here. Um, they have a whole bunch of, you know, artifacts. They even have some dinosaur bones and shit like that. There's all kinds of stuff. And in, in less than an hour um, or so, you find a glass cabinet uh, that contains what appear to be um, some South American or Central American artifacts, uh, pottery, utensils, things like that. Um, and among them, um, on its own stand, kind of up on a shelf in the back of the glass cabinet, you see what apparently is the star stone. Mm. Um, it's about the size of a fist. It's a five-pointed star. And in the very center of the stone, you can see what appears to be engraved in it, um, a flaming eyeball, like a flaming eye in the middle of it. And Does it... you guys would immediately recognize it as, a, as an elder sign. Okay. As described, you know, in in the books, as described in the Somerset tablets and so forth. What security look like around here? How many people are there around? Cops? Anything? Uh, it's pretty crowded. I mean, there are people walking around the museum. There are some secure, some uniformed security officers milling about. They're armed. Oh, but, they're I mean, armed. But I'm talking. Oh. This, yeah, I'm talking like this is broad daylight. You know, I mean, this is, you know, mid afternoon to 2 p.m. or so. Alessio um, turns to a uh, spark on a sparky. The sparky is like, do you, do you know anybody here at this institution? Do you guys have any contacts? Well, we do. Um, but I think if, if <clears throat> this is the object we actually have one of these already you guys would know i mean the doctor would because we have the we have the shield the shield yes. yusufus made yeah so i don't know that we need to get this i mean i think it's a great idea that's why that's why marshall turns to the guys and he's like this is the thing that i've been you know striving to learn Yes, it certainly fits the description given in the Somerset tablets um, of an elder sign. Um, Much and, at some, longer. and at some point, you guys, you, you guys did realize, you know, given the description of the incantation and, and the description of the use of these things, um, it actually mentioned, I believe, in in the description of the spell that it can be uh, made of, you know, stone or metal. Um, and it's something that you can carry around with you. And that's, I believe, what gave Yusufus the idea of the, of the shield. Um, but uh, this also, you know, I should point out that this star stone is sitting among these ancient artifacts. So it, it, it itself, it looks like it's pretty old. Hundreds, if not thousands of years old. I mean, I don't think any of you guys have any archaeological knowledge, really. Um you can give me an archaeology check if you want. All right. Why not? Why not? Archaeology check. Here we go. I think some of you actually, eh, I think Jake and those guys had some archaeology from reading Nameless Cults. Fumble. <laughs> I think this thing is pretty recently made. <laughs> yeah. It looks like a star stone. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but but you know, to Van Helsing and to Sparky it does it does fit the description almost exactly of uh what you guys would know as an elder sign for sure. How much how much longer do you have to study Sparky before you I'd have to I'd consult make with things. the god of our universe. What are you talking about? To learn Elder Sign? Yeah, because I've been working on that. Yeah, let me check. I probably marked it on the calendar. Mm. I think Sparky was also reading the Necronomicon. Yeah, but I abandoned that because I was just like, 
based on the number of weeks and what I wanted to get, I didn't want to read any more than Necronomicon. And I couldn't because of the Greek anyway. So I was just going through Yusufus's, um, you know, translation along with, uh, you know, uh, mm-hmm. oh my God, I can't remember, for uh, Percy's stuff. Yeah, I think Sparky, you're getting pretty close. Probably within the next week, week with a little bit of further study and uh, putting the, together the almost, you know, cryptic notes of Doctor Farnsworth and uh, Percy Fawcett and Yusufus Braun. Uh, within the next week or so, you think you'd probably be able to figure out how to make one. So there's no reason to steal this one. No, I, I don't think causes, so. I mean, I think it would cause a serious problem. But we might want to stop by and and visit with the people that we do know here. <clears throat> well, you do notice that you know attached to the museum is the library, yes. uh, which which, which oh. connects which connects to the museum. Um, and of note, uh, there is a public section of the library and there's also a private section of the library. Use your good looks and charm, Sparky. Get us, get us in here. All right. Get us into the private section. There are ancient books. Well, I will, uh, I will go see if we who did we know here it wasn't it wasn't morgan because he obviously turned out to be a bad seed but yeah was, who was Armitage? It? yeah henry armitage, uh, the, armitage head, yeah. the head library and the curator of the museum um you don't know him personally but you know that uh that jacob had met him personally and they had some dealings there were some letters sent back and forth i believe he helped you guys um i think it was ambassador dollarin actually who sent him the letter when you guys had found the Necronomicon, just kind of probing uh, Dr. Armitage's knowledge a little bit. And it was from clues that he gave you that you figured out that indeed what you guys possessed was a an original Greek copy of the Necronomicon. Well, he might be the person to talk to you to get somebody who could help us find a Greek translator we could trust. Or he might have an English version of the Necronomicon here. He might, but then we would have to stay here. You know what I mean? Unless we took it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unless we took it. Um, all right, well, uh, I'll go ask for Armitage. Okay. Um, you're able to set up a meeting with uh, Dr. Ar- Armitage uh, tomorrow morning at his office. <laughs> All right. Through his cool. personal secretary. We'll, uh, we'll we'll explore the parts of the library that we do have access to today, and I'll try to chat up, you know, the the uh, the librarians, you know, my charm. Okay. Charm the ladies. Anything specific that you're looking for in a library? Uh, yeah, let's order, you know, like the order of the, um, the Silver Twilight. Any mention of them, the Yog Sothoth? Uh... Okay. I mean, well, I mean, you know, the, 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 the cult groups, you know, like references to them. Okay. I don't um, know, guys. Anything else you guys want to take a look at while we're here? Taylor techniques. Good. Everybody, give, everybody give me a library use check. Jesus. Hmm. All right, Doctor. Yeah, you can click the green one. Yay! Dun, dun, dun. Dr. Van Helsing gets a hard success. Yeah, Damn, dude, that's awesome. Roll, Tom. So, as far as the Yog Soth authority, <laughs> um, you're not able to really find much. You do find a section having to do with the occult, um, 
And actually, several of these volumes that you find in the Miskatonic Library um, are very similar to some of the occult volumes that you guys found in the, the basement of uh, the lodge in Boston. Some of them are actually the same books. Um, but nothing, you know, nothing really too interesting. So it kind of occurs to you, Dr. Van Helsing, that, you know, maybe you should do some, you know, a little research in some of the, uh, you know, the names and places uh, and things like that that you've learned recently from uh, the revelations coming out of Scotland. All right. And uh, let me take you back over here. Make sure you mark your skill, Tom. Did it. So you find a, a couple of things here. You find a uh, in among copies um, of proceedings of the Royal Geographical Society volumes. You find a story uh, that has to do with Henry Hancock. It says member returns from Congo Basin. Henry M. Hancock disembarked at Southampton recently after two months expedition somewhere along the Congo River's drainage. The accomplished archaeologist indicated that he and Dr. Adam Chisholm had some success in locating evidence connected to an unnamed place, termed by Dr. Chisholm as a semi-mythic location. Owing to Dr. Chisholm's unfortunate illness, their expedition was interrupted, and publication of their findings must await a fresh trip into the canyons of the Ituri Kendi. The mm. partners partners plan a new expedition next year meanwhile they look forward to the bracing air and sturdy virtues of scotland as they rest near inverness mr hancock would not comment upon a recent lord article appearing in london daily the scoop except to castigate whoever is responsible for attributing feverish dreams to his stricken friend and partner dr chisholm mm -hmm. so that prompts you to, so that prompts you uh this is dated uh, late last year, like December okay. 1923. So that kind of prompts you to do some perusing among the newspapers um, in here, looking for some copies of the London Scoop, you know, recent copies of that. Um, and after a little looking with your hard success, you're able to locate some excerpts. Um, you find what apparently was an interview, uh, the London Scoop, um, as you realize, as you're looking at it, it's a tabloid type thing. Um, but there's an interview with Dr. Chisholm and Chisholm says the rainforests there are absolutely trackless. It would take an army to hack their way through directly. One must approach circuitously, circuitously to north and then all the way round down from the top of the watershed, taking advantage of the river flow to be carried into the canyons. And the scoop says it was the unexplored canyons that you found a new danger. Was it not, sir? Dr. Chisholm, vis visibly shuddering, it says, yes, the experience nearly drove me mad. Being forced to run the gauntlet of the river-born dingy dingy was utterly terrifying. The things are like motile leeches, but much larger, the size of horses. Lord, and they are very good swimmers. One of them can exsanguinate a man as quickly as you or I might skin a rabbit. The scoop, dreadful, yet you plan to go back there? Dr. Chisholm, my good friend Hancock is keen on it, and I have learned to trust his judgment utterly. By next year, my hands will be steady enough for anything. And this is an excerpt that you find from The Terror on the Edge of the World, which is a London scoop story in this tabloid, this tabloid magazine. Mm -hmm. um, That's our next trip to be uh, to Africa. Quite horrifying, actually. Yeah, things as big as horses that can sanguinate you. That sounds bad. Dingy Dingy was utterly terrifying. <laughs> the hell? Um, so that prompts you. Uh, everybody give me another library use roll. Since you guys are kind of killing time in the Miskatonic Library here. What are we 
rolling for? Library use again. Oh, okay. Two, two, two. Library use. Hooray! Yeah. Oh! Oh, Extreme, man. Ooh. So Van Helsing shares this with you. He says, hey, look look what I found on Hancock. This is pretty interesting. Um, so that makes you kind of think like, well, you know, who else can you? What about this uh, the Chantrain lady? Let's see if we can find anything on Chantrain, right? Is that the French lady? Yeah. So it takes you a while. Um, and then... Uh, Sparky, you remember um, Jacob telling you when they first started doing research on the Hermetic Order of the Silver Twilight, um, they kind of came across these leads and these stories that, you know, led them to believe that something had this, these guys had to do with witches, you know, which led them to learning that John Scott was burned as a witch, right? So you think, well, let me look in these, these witchcraft books and you find something very interesting in this book called Occult Brethren, uh, written in 1902 by a Clive Waite. And you see this entry. Oops. You see this one entry, and the name Chantrain catches your eye. It says in Edinburgh in 1745, Anne de Chantrain, a young girl in her late teens, was arrested on charges of witchcraft. She was released later that year upon order of a local justice, a peer. So you're going to think, hmm, Anne de Chantrain. Well, the name is similar, right? Uh, so that kind of leads you a little further and deeper. With your extreme success, I'm going to give you something else. Um, you find this. You find this very large, thick uh, tome uh, called Great Witches of Britain. And it seems to be a pretty exhaustive work um, on witchcraft in Britain. And in the index, you find the name Andy Chantrain. Ooh. So on, on page 546, you find this excerpt here. It says, there are almost no instances of witchcraft reported in the Western Highlands in the last 400 years. In March of 1620, Anne de Chantrain was arrested and charged with witchcraft in the town of Inverness. She was 17 years old, lively, intelligent, and unusually pretty, um, which roughly correlates with what you found in the Occult Brethren book. But it goes on to say, Anne de Chantrain was held in prison for a year before being tortured three times. All three interrogations were made after she fully confessed her evil acts. She was held in prison for another year and burned at the stake on October 18, 1622. The priest present at the execution wrote, The prisoner was stupid, and I did not understand what she said, though sometimes she seemed quite right in her mind. Such an ugly, wicked girl deserved to die. Her pretense of insanity did not fool me for a moment. Hmm. Mm, almost doesn't even sound like the same person. Uh, in the other, the other excerpt above, she was released later that year upon order of a year. Right. So we have a difference of historical fact over, over a hundred years, though. Actually, yeah. Sure. So, that one's 1845, and this one's 1620. So, so think about this once again. You have found information in these old books on witchcraft that seem to possibly have names of these Hermetic Order of the Silver Twilight people associated with them. Now, and de Chantrain, the name is spelled the same. Same first name, same last name. Even the de is in there. So, if this person is of the same ilk of someone, say, like John Scott, apparently she was held in prison in 1622, and if she is indeed the same person, then she was also arrested 
in 1745, over 100 years after that. So. The salt's wow. better back. I don't know. Don't burn them. That's for sure. That does not work. Well, or if you burn them, make sure you burn them and scatter the ashes. Mm -hmm. Do you really burn them? Burn them. Remember, you know, you crush the ashes and throw them down the sewer and put them in a cat's box and throw them in the wind. <laughs> you scatter them all over the place, man. <laughs> So there, you find a few things in the Miskatonic Library that may be of use, or may not. You don't even know if it's the same person, but the name definitely, I mean, maybe she's an ancestor. But then you think back, that the way Jacob described it, that's kind of what you guys thought at first about uh, John Scott. Maybe he was just an ancestor, you know, of this John Scott guy here in Boston, right? But further clues kind of uh, debunked that whole thing. So the first thing we have to do when we meet this uh, French chick is try to cast that salt spell on her. See if we can turn her back into dust before she even knows what hit her. If she'll have no idea who we are. No. Yeah. So that could be could be useful information. Could be nothing. They might even not even be the same people, but uh, make sure you check that skill there, Sparky. That was a good roll. I sure yeah. did. Does the doc so the doctor and Sparky know some spell? <laughs> what? It, yeah, wonders Alessio. Alessio's like, huh? So yeah, we know the spell. We can if if these we are can the make same our people, own rock, Alessio. That's what so, you need to know. Says Doctor Van Helsing, who is obviously all popped up on cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> I know what to do. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like this is like, we know, <laughs> yes, we know the spell. <laughs> <coughs> we know the spell. <laughs> nice. And everybody wonders where the music came from. <laughs> what? What was that? <laughs> yeah. All right, so you guys are spending the night in Arkham, I assume. Yes. Okay. So 9 a.m. rolls around. Let's see. It is August 6th, Wednesday. Did we, did we meet with that guy? Yeah, you're meeting him this morning at his office. Um, so you're greeted by Armitage's uh, secretary. Um, at his office the next morning. His his office is on the second floor um, of the museum. Uh, up at the, this little office space, there's a row. There's a hallway up there with kind of a row of of uh, offices, and uh, she leads you into Armistad's <laughs> office. And uh, you see an elder, elderly bearded gentleman uh, sitting behind a great oak desk. Um, and there are all kinds of you know artifacts on these shelves on on his wall and. Uh, photos of him when he was younger, uh, which he look, he looks to be standing among other, uh, professors or, or done these archeological looks like a bunch of archeological digs, things like that. Um, any any, elder signs on the shelf? <laughs> no, no. Okay. Van Helsing's looking around any elder signs. <laughs> no, at least nothing obvious. Okay. Um, but he stands, um, you know, and he, he extends his hand. He comes and walks around his desk and extends his hand to you. And <coughs> gentlemen, we introduce ourselves. Yeah, Doctor Henry Armitage. Pleased to meet you. Pleased uh, to well, meet you. I've read many good things about you, Doctor Armitage. It's a pleasure to finally meet you, this Marshall is, uh, Sparks. This is, yes, Mister Sparks. I understand that you're a relative of Jacob Croninshield. I am. Hmm, I was so sorry to hear about what happened. Well, as you know, um, Jacob and, and all of us are, um, well, adventurers of the, uh, of the mind and, and of, of many of these objects that, uh, we see in the, in the museum here itself. So 
Um, I'm sure you understand there's great risk involved. Yes, I got the impression from uh, from Jacob um, and also, you know, Mr. Braun, Mr. Fawcett and the Central American Expedition um, that you are all enlightened, shall we say? That sounds accurate. So, so, so what service may I be? Well, um, I, I, I go ahead and, and, and tell them basically what, what we've encountered. And I don't mince words about it either since he's in the know. Where are you starting from? Um, I'll, the beginning. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll take him from the start. I'll take him through the the account of Yusufus Braun and, you know, the dark child and... Dark child and everything, huh? Yeah. Advice. He sits very quietly. Um, and once you get up to the part, you know, about the dark... Um, so, so you're starting with, like, the history of, you know, starting with Jacob Crown and Shield and Central America and all that, and then up to present? Yeah. Okay. Around when you begin talking about Yusufus's uh, dealings, uh, tormented dealings with the Dark Child, he removes his spectacles and sets them on his desk and gets this kind of incredulous look on his face. Um, he seems visibly shaken as you tell the story. Um, and then when you start getting, I mean, you're telling him about the lodge and everything, right? Yeah. The, the, the inner sanctum and all that, huh? Yeah, we, I mean, there's no reason to hold back. This guy, if he's enlightened as he says he is, then he may be our biggest ally. Or we might have to kill him in his office. One of the two. You could, you could edit some, though. Yeah, fully. you kind of kind of give him the cliff notes, right? Yeah, exactly. You don't have to get fully involved in the gory details. You can no, just... it's, it's, not the, it's not the William Shatner retelling of it, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, he says, so obviously there is some cult activity that you all have become involved in, in Boston and New York, uh, and apparently now in, in Scotland. And he says, what is, what is their purpose? What, what are they, what are they doing? What is their, what is their goal? Do you know? <coughs> we 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 know their their goal is to bring things forth onto this plane of existence that don't belong here it it almost seems like the goal is to you know conquer earth and we also know that they're reaching out even beyond these places that you heard of more they're they're, they're making contacts in Germany, Egypt, Africa. They're expanding. They're trying to develop a larger network. Yeah, they are. They Exactly. And they're, and they're you know, as you can tell from our, our telling of the, you know, the tale in New York, I mean, they're, they're using innocent people to power their, you know, their... Well, their, Alessio, Alessio is like they've destroyed... They destroyed people's lives, you know, Jacob's life, the, the doctor's daughter. What is it do you think you saw in New York at the murdering? Meeting? What what was the question? What is it do you think you saw at the meeting hall in New York that night? I, all I can yeah, say is that. that being in World War One with Jacob and all of the things he's seen until now and not having him shaken to the core and then to have a, a break of such a magnitude, it, it had to be something from another world. Shocking. Horrifying, he says. Yes. He says, in, he says, in my many years, I have come to have the privilege of studying 
certain histories, you see. We possess one of the best libraries on these matters in the world. These books. Oh, um, I guess I should ask, do, do you let him know that you guys possess the Necronomicon? Or, or do you just tell him that you have books or tomes or anything like that? Um, we're not going to tell him we have the Necronomicon. But we'll tell him that we've, you know, he would know about some of the books that we had because Farnsworth would have, right. you know, relayed that at least. So we'll we'll disclose only that amount, you know. He says, gentlemen, you seem to have uncovered what many before you have claimed to uncover. He says, in my studies... I have learned things that I am not want to share freely with many of my colleagues. But if what you say is true about this hermetic order of the Silver Twilight, I believe that it is dire. And I believe that it has to do with what some of these books speak of, namely the end time. And he stands up and he says, come with me. And he walks into an adjoining uh, room to his office. And uh, in this room are bookshelves uh, with many, many books. And he goes up to one of the bookshelves and he pulls off a uh, uh, an untitled book. And he sets it down on this. There's this big table in the middle of the room. And he asks you to sit down. And he begins. And he says. Uh, I believe that what you may have encountered. In New York. Um, is what some call. The crawling chaos. Or. Near Latotep. And he opens up the book. And flipping through the pages. And he begins reading. He says. This being different, he reads, he quote, he's reading from the book. He says, this being differs from the other beings in a number of ways. Most of them are exiled to stars like yogg Sothoth and Haster, or sleeping and dreaming like Cthulhu. Near Lothotep, however, is active and frequently walks the earth in the guise of a human being. Usually tall, slim, joyous man. Most of these beings have their own cults serving them, while, <coughs> while near Lothotep seems to serve them and take care of their affairs in their absence. Most of them use alien, strange alien languages, while near Lothotep uses human languages and can be mistaken <coughs> for a human being. And he kind of looks at you and he says, "This, he says, uh, this is why when you speak of this Mr. Black and what happened that night." Um, I believe that this being may have taken human form. He says, most of them are all powerful, yet purposeless. Yet Nirlathotep seems to be deliberately deceptive and manipulative and even uses propaganda to achieve his goals. In this regard, he is probably the most human-like among them. He says, and he kind of takes off his spectacles and sets them down. And he says, I believe that what you encountered that night in New York was this being. And uh, he stands up and he takes another book off the shelf. Uh, and he begins reading. He says, oh, yes, here it is. He says, the crawling chaos enacts the will of the outer gods and is their messenger, heart and soul. He is also a servant of Azathoth, who wishes he, whose wishes he immediately fulfills. Unlike the outer gods, causing madness is more important and enjoyable than death and destruction to Nirlathotep. In this sense, he strongly resembles the traditional role of the devil. Dun dun dun. <laughs> and he said, and he closes the book, and he says. I believe he recognizes that word. Yeah, he says, I believe that according to 
some of my studies uh, in the Necronomicon, uh, we possess some Latin translations of the Necronomicon. And according to some of my studies, I believe that Nir Lothotep will play some part in the end time, which is uh, mentioned in, uh, in many sources uh, having to do with uh, these beings. It is stated specifically that he will allow Niagtha to wipe the earth clean. And he seems to be kind of quoting from memory here as he kind of looks up at the ceiling as he's quoting. It is stated that he will allow a being called Niagtha to wipe the earth clean in preparation for the return of the great old ones. Does not, I have not been able to specify how Nirlathotep will accomplish this, the return of the great old ones. And I have failed to find any time frame for this to occur. Um, although I have found some hints that it would presumably be after the fall of something called Zothik some 5,000 years in the future. So indeed, I believe that what you encountered in New York was this being, this man, this god. Are you and, aware of any way to defeat him or to send him back to where he came from? I do not. He says, I have only recently, within the last couple of years, um, become more interested in studying these these books. For, for a very long time, I sort of dismissed them as uh, myth and legend, uh, much of it stemming from old Sumerian and Babylonian myths and legends. Um, but within the last couple of years, I have identified um, in the sources I've identified the fact that these many of the sources that this material comes from predates the Sumerian civilization by thousands of years. Hmm. We need your stone. We need, need your stone. The stone? You mean the yeah. star stone? Yes. And why do you need the Star Stone? What, what are you planning, gentlemen? Well, we're planning on helping to prevent the end of times. It might be best for you not to know exactly what we're doing, other than we're defenders of all that is good and, you know, that is uh, life on this earth. For, yeah, he, for he if says, you were to know more of what our plans are, you could be susceptible to attack and also endanger us. Yes, yes, indeed, Mr. Sparks. I think perhaps it would be better um, if I don't know all of your plans. Obviously, you do recognize the fact that your lives are in danger. Yes. Yeah, and and I think you know the other piece to this is, in addition to um, asking for the stone, we'd like to have access to your private collection here to see if there's anything we can find in here to help aid us in our quest to put this to an end. Yes, of course. What did you have in mind? Library use rolls. <laughs> <laughs> Can I borrow your Necronomicon? Hmm. I can read Latin very well. Well, it so happens, Dr. Van Helsing, that the Latin translations we have um, are Spanish editions. Four of them, in fact. Um, he says, "I'm also Four aware of the of fact." Them? Yeah, I'm also aware of the fact that the Widener Library at Harvard um, also possesses possesses a Spanish edition. Um, let me see here. 
and he walks over to this uh, this sort of bureau, and he pulls out this drawer, and it looks like an index. Oh, there's all these index cards and stuff in there, and he's flipping through them. He says, as far as the Latin translations of the Necronomicon, um, two German specimens lie in the British Museum. Um, also, at Salem's Kester Library, there's a German specimen. Um, I also believe that other Spanish editions are circulating among private collectors. Um, oh, of course. Have you ever heard of the John Dr. John D. version of the Necronomicon? No. There was an English translation made by Dr. Dr. John D. around 1586 while he was touring Europe in the company of Edward Kelly. And although evidence is inconclusive, it's believed that D.'s version is believed to have been made from the extant Greek manuscript version owned by a certain Baron von Hauptmann, Transylvania. Really? Of course, the D translations heavily expurgated and often re reinterpreted. Um, it exists only in manuscript form. Three complete copies of the D manuscript are known to exist. And do you have one? Alas, no. It's rumored that Back in the mid 1600s, 1650s, um, it was thought that one of the uh, one of the D manuscripts was owned by the Watley family of Dunwich. Although I haven't really followed up on that. Whatever happened to the Watleys? Hmm. I believe their ancestors still live in the area. See what else? He's looking through his cards. He says the lost Greek translation was made around 950 AD by Theodorus Philetus, Constantinople. It was Philetus who named the work the Necronomicon, most likely after the first words in the book. And unlike later versions, the original Greek manuscript contains accurate copies of most of El Azred's charts and tables. Numerous copies of the manuscript circulated among scholars until the year 1050, when it was banned by the Patriarch Michael and publicly burned. Of course, in 1501, an unknown Italian printer, possibly Manutius, published a folio-sized edition of the Greek version of fewer than 100 copies. Made from one of the last surviving manuscripts, the printed edition unfortunately lacked most of the charts and tables. And it was the last evidence we have for the existence of a complete Greek manuscript. The last Greek printed version was believed burned along with the rest of a certain Salem man's library in 1692. Although, another copy is supposedly held at San Marcos University in Lima, Peru. They have an original, right? Who? Barky and the Doctor. Yes. Yes, they do. They have the original. I mean, they have the we original. Have a, with Greek. all the tables and charts in it. Yep. Yes, apparently they have uh, either the original or a copy from yeah, what appears from what the information that he's giving you, um, it's probably one of the numerous copy, copies circulated around 1050 AD when it was banned and publicly burned by the church. Um, although there is a distinct possibility uh, that you possess the actual uh, Greek translation by Theodorus Philetus around 950 AD. Wow. Well, I mean, I don't know. 
maybe after we leave, we can talk about it. Maybe, maybe this guy would be the best place for this, or I don't know. Yeah, and you know the he tells you straight up that the Miskatonic possesses four Spanish editions of the Latin translation. You can do that, can Someone has Latin. Doesn't have a, someone have Latin? I have Latin. Mm-hmm. But yes, the, the, can I read what, that? What, well, well, I should be clear. I should be clear. When I say four Spanish editions, I'm not saying that they are written in Spanish. They or they were published Ready. by Spanish printers. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, got it. Okay. Well, yes. I, I speak. I've got Latin at twenty percent. So yeah, sixty-five percent. In Spain, yeah. So try to together try to, we make it eighty-five percent. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll I'll say um, you know along with the stone, and you know what we are trying to attempt. Could we borrow one of these Spanish editions that mm. would probably greatly aid us in our in our task. I know having these in the collection is invaluable, but isn't saving the planet Earth also somewhat invaluable? Charm, charm, dark sparkle in his eye. Yeah, he's like, indeed, they, they are invaluable, and this decision wouldn't be entirely be up to me. Um, he says, of course, I would allow you access uh, to, to study the books here. Sparky, give me a persuade. Come on, Sparky. Eight. Nailed it. Dude. All right, give me one you second here. just guy up the ass if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not interested, but... Uh... No, I'm, I'm not either. I'm just saying you could. You, you convinced him. You extremely convinced him. Uh... I'll give you two of the copies. Why not? <laughs> he says, well, he says, I'm, I'm going to have to think, think it over. Uh, can, can you give me a day or two to, to, uh, to consult? Um, of course. He, he says, uh, uh, of course, if I were to agree, uh, to, to lend you uh, one of the specimens, could you provide any collateral? What would be acceptable collateral? We have all those, you guys, I, I mean, I don't know, but you guys know you have all those antiques, those Egyptian artifacts. I don't know, well, perhaps a sizable, sizable contribution or donation to, to the museum? Oh, Unless he was like, how, how much? How much are you looking for? <laughs> what, what? What's what's well, sizable? What's his, sizable? His, he kind of blushes and he's like, "Well, uh. <laughs> no, just t just straight out. What? How much? How much money you're looking for?" <laughs> <laughs> well, we could. What? What about um, another uh, another valuable artifact? We have. Um, and I, I know we have many of these. We have like eight of them, but we have these golden medallions. One of them that we could part with as yeah, uh, that sounds interesting. Well, Did they the were. You mean the medallions that you you yeah, found one, in the yeah, Honduras? I, I say we have one of them. Yeah, hmm. we could part with. And we and you guys also have those Egyptian artifacts that you. Be one of those along with you know. Hmm. Yeah, the ones that we took from the uh, cabin. Yeah, before you burned it to the ground. <laughs> oh. Oh, and I got that kaleidoscope too from the future. Hmm. He says yes. Uh, that that might be acceptable. So how about those things along with, um, I mean, you know, we, uh, 
We're not opposed to making a donation. Because obviously, this is going to become a partnership now. Well, yeah, and yeah, and he actually he actually speaks to you a little bit about this, Sparky. He he lets you guys know that ever since the Morgan X, the Morgan Expedition affair, um, last year, um, that he has done a lot more digging. Um, into, you know, what you guys claim to have found down there and your experiences and stuff like this um, with the help of uh, Dr. Farnsworth um, and others. And uh, he he just kind of lets you know, like, he, he kind of half expected um, either you um, or other associates of Crown and Shield and Braun and these others uh, that went through this down in the Central American jungles uh, to approach him at some point. Um, because he felt that that was not, the, it was not the end of uh, the, the story that is playing out, uh, that it was merely the beginning. So basically what he's telling you is that he's willing to trust you on this. And he feels that if you think that one of these editions of the Necronomicon would be helpful to you um, in any way, that he he's willing to help you in that in that regard. Okay, well um, that sounds good. And and you know, so if he needs a day, they'll allow yeah. us to go back and you know grab a few of these things for collateral. And then we can also talk about just straight giving this guy this Greek book because, guys, we can't really use it. Well, not yet. I don't want to get rid of the Greek book yet. One of our new characters might speak Greek. And if this has got the tables and charts in it, we might need to translate it after we get done reading the Latin well, version. Here's, here's the thing you can do. You can compare the two copies. Exactly. You can use the, 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 the Latin version to try to translate more closely the... The charts. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's you have to. I definitely <laughs> right. keep the, the Greek version. Yeah, I don't okay. want to give away those charts. All right, well, that got voted yeah. out soundly. But anyways, we we'll do the other stuff. And also, before you guys leave, he he also strongly recommends um, that this information stay be between us. Oh yes. Um, and that there are people and worse. Um, in this world that would kill you for this book, just so you understand. Um, he says, especially after what you've told me about your, your exploits um, and, and your adventures, per se, um, it's very dangerous to even be in possession um, of this book. May I ask who you are going to consult with? I mean, given this danger, I mean, should you be talking to other people outside? That, and, and other people know that we have this? He says, trust me, Dr. Van Helsing, there are, there are others such as I um, that well know uh, the dangers involved um, in what's happening. And uh, I can tell you with utmost confidence that um, any of my associates uh, that I would choose to consult on this matter um, We'll keep your secrets, and we're going to keep this strictly confidential. I promise you that. Okay. I accept his explanation. Okay. All right. Uh, nice roll, Sparky. Oh. Yeah, Yay. man. Nailed it. My pleasure to have some great roles. I had some pretty crappy ones to start the night, so that was good. Yeah, Sparky turned on the charm there. He, he kind of like used the argument like, it's the end of the world, Dr. Exactly. Arbitrage. <laughs> exactly. <You know? laughs> and then I, then I, then I uh, you know, smile. With yeah. The glancing, you know. Like it, it was the crawling chaos. <laughs> it is here among us 
you, I guess you kind of almost like you almost kind of scared them into into giving it to you in a way. Uh, you know. <clears throat> All right. All right. So we'll we'll take care of that business. So you guys are going to trade what exactly for the for the uh, Spanish edition here? Do one what? of the do one of the amulets, um, of the Egyptian artifacts, and. How much money does he need? He he didn't really say. That's really kind of going to be up to you guys how much how much cash you want to donate to the cause there. Give us an idea because I don't know what with inflation. What's it, like a thousand dollars? I mean, or, or ten thousand dollars? Yeah, we talking? Rough, roughly multiply a nineteen twenties dollar by ten, and, and that's what it's worth now. So like a thousand dollars is ten thousand dollars now. You want to split? You want to split a thousand dollars between the three of us? Yeah, I'll do that in a heartbeat. Yep. You now you guys are gonna have to probably uh, empty some bank accounts, or at least partially empty them. Actually, uh, Spar actually, Sparky's wealthy, isn't he? Yeah, he's got tons of money. I believe. I think the doctor is too. Yeah, you guys pay yeah. up. Yeah, I think we kind of revise that. Um. So we can, uh, I don't know, 500 from the doctor, 500 from uh, Sparky. Done. All right. So you guys pay a visit to the bank. I'm assuming you're making a day trip back to Boston and then coming back and making the trade, right? Yep. All right. So we'll take that into consideration. The calendar here. Let me see if any. Let me see if any. Ven let me see if any vengeance bears show up. Oh, nope, shit. not yet. Thank God. Um, all right, so we're looking at Friday, August 8th, 1924. So it's been roughly a week since the meeting hall incident. Um, the news is <clears throat> a week later that uh, Jacob is going to be tried for capital murder, and he is pleading insanity. Um, his case is going to come before the court next month. Um, but his lawyers are telling you, Sparky, that it doesn't look good. Uh, it looks like he's going to get, at the very least, a life sentence. At the very least. Which, honestly, he hasn't made any kind of sign of recovery. So, uh, honestly, it's it's... Jacob personally, it looks like it's really what happens to him is really not going to matter to him personally because he is he's been he's been declared insane um, mm. possibly incurably insane but he's, he's already made several suicide attempts unfortunately he... damn All right. baby all right, so you guys make the deal with Armitage, um, and you get the uh, specimen. It is a printed copy, black letter. Um, the book contains, you guys are inspecting it after you receive it. He gives you some time to kind of look it over in a private study, right? Um, the book contains very many, uh, quite a few uh, cracked and worn woodcuts, actual thin plates of wood inserted into the binding. Um, it is folio sized. Uh, it's very old and very in pretty good condition, though, for a 15th century book. And uh, <coughs> it is in Latin. There you go, Excellent. Doctor. You have your wish. Excellent. I start studying immediately. All right. So August 8th, the magical day. Do I have to roll? How long this is going to take me? Well, let me look at it here. So roughly 132 hours to skim. So, uh, what is that? Uh, 
That's it's going to take you, man. It's going to take you about five days uh, to to give it a first good read through. Um, and holy shit, somebody's burning rubber. Yeah, the, I, I don't know. The kids are out having fun tonight around here, apparently. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it's going to take you about five days to skim, um, and at that point you'll learn, um, you know, any spells that it may contain, so on and so forth. Um, you'll probably find some horrible things in there too uh, that will require probably some sanity loss, um, and then you'll be able to study any spells that may be in there. Cool. And uh, let's see. You estimate that it's going to take, if you were to read and fully comprehend the entire thing, uh, it, it would take you the better part of a year um, of study to to read the entire thing. It's it's a thick book, you know, over over three hundred pages, um, and it's very you know cryptic and like I said, it's it's in black letter print and it's it's kind of very small. Um, <laughs> so, you know, imagine like a folio sized tome full of very kind of cramped print uh, with mathematical formulas and strange shit. So about a year to read and uh, five days to skim. All right. I start skimming. Okay. And you guys hand over uh, was it one golden medallion? One golden medallion. A miscellaneous Egyptian artifact. And a thousand dollars. Oh, and did he give us the elder sign? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he gives you a star stone. Cool. Woohoo! Um, apparently, he has several. Oh. Yeah. Excellent. He tells so you that. Party some, has... tells you that, yeah, he tells you that some of them were found in uh, some ruins just outside Mexico City. Um, others have been found in the Congo Basin, Africa. It says these have been we've they have been found all over the world in the last hundred years or so, and I've managed to to collect a number of them. How big is this thing, Sean? Is it you know, It's about pretty... the size. It's about the size of a fist. Okay, cool. It, it, so would, fit, it would fit in your pocket. Yeah. Does he have he enough throw that, throw that in your pocket. What'd you say, Tom? Does he have enough for all of us? Does he have three? He's only willing to part with one. Okay. As part of this particular bargain, anyway. Okay. It'd be nice I mean, if we all had one. Who's got the shield? I mean, he Spartan just gave, he just gave you a priceless book, Tom. I I know, I know. I'm being <laughs> greedy. I know. Yeah. Uh, the shield's in the safe. It's, it's in the safe. So. Okay. And probably soon, Sparky will be able to learn, you know, how to create your own as well. Yep. And it's going to take a little bit of sacrifice. Which reminds me, I guess I should tell you now, Sparky. Um, so, you know, remember the meeting at Look to the Future? Yep. With Mr. Black, where you were present? Um, you probably didn't feel the effect so much um, afterwards because you were kind of laid up in the hospital uh, and quite mad. Uh, but you lost five points of power that night uh, due, no. due to the evil spell cast by Mr. Black. Um, so you're going to have to mark that off of your sheet. Power. Permanent loss? Power loss. Permanent permanent whoa so spark your power is going down to 45 got it um note that that also takes your max magic points down to nine okay so change that 10 to a nine and you're good shit yep that's stardos yeah so well, he got me good for that shot i pulled off in his head <laughs> right so, you know, according to the old rules, like when you cast the uh, the Elder Sign, you, you have to sacrifice one point of power permanently. Um, and I've actually been meaning to do this. I was going to look up the new version, but I, I bet it says five points of power because everything's just multiplied by five now. 
And I bet it does. All right, so you guys have taken care of business in Arkham. Nice. Um, Very well, successful. Awesome. Good, good roll, Sparky. Rather successful. Yeah, that was that was yep. pretty good. It's huge. So now you guys can delve even further into the madness of the Necronomicon, you crazy bastards. <laughs> <laughs> it's all for the greater good. Solve the doctor with his sure. giant bottle of cocaine. Exactly. <laughs> Books. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta trust the decision maker that's always using cocaine. I, yeah, I, I, I get in the back seat of the car, do a couple bumps, and start skimming the book. First, you get the away. Necronomicon, then you get the power. <laughs> right, then you get the woman. <laughs> um, all right. With many so, tentacles. Exactly, she's grabby, baby. Um, <laughs> all right, so. Uh, Oh my we're goodness! Back on, we're back hey. on the yacht. They upped the elder sign cost to ten power. I knew it. Brat. What? Yeah. I mean, you're not gonna be able to cast it, uh, Sparky. But no, no, no. That's, well, no, that's no, no, no. magic. That's magic points. That's not power. No, no, no. no. It, it is power. But but since you guys have the Somerset tablets version, we're gonna keep it at five power. See, see, since we're going to the new rules, is everything's going to be kind of multiplied by five, right? So before, you had to sacrifice one power in order to cast Elder Sign, which now would translate into five power points, five power. The book says ten, but that's for the regular version. You guys have a special Somerset Tablets version. So it will still cost you five power to activate the Elder Sign. And I don't think anything... This is where we, this is where we hire the student. <laughs> yeah, just say these words and yeah, everything will be fine. Here, take these. I feel weak. Here's some remember, juice, take some these. cookies. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. remember, the spell says the writings of certain scribes apart. The elder sign is worthless in personal defense if the monster or minion can evade the sign. Those wearing an elder sign around the neck, for instance, might gain protection for a few square inches of flesh where the sign rests against the skin. However, the rest of the wearer's body would be completely vulnerable. So mm -hmm. really where it's useful is warding Whoa. portals, entrances, doorways, tunnels, things like that. Wearing it around your neck and hoping that it will save you is probably not going to work. You have to place it like at an entrance. Or... Exactly. Yeah, it's like you're running away from something horrible and you throw it in the doorway. Yes. And you've seen that, you know, well, you got, you haven't personally, but it worked down in Honduras, you know, when Percy cast it on the, the floor, on the gate to the dream lens, it worked. Yeah. So. Amazing. <clears throat> All right. So uh, we're going to explain. Explore the meeting hall. We're going to go blow up the lodge. I'm going to go to Scotland. I meeting just, hall we should... How about this Pollard guy? I mean, you guys know well, where, he, where he lives. We do know where Pollard is, but do we hear back from Ben Knuckles? I I check in by telegram. Have, have you guys turned up any sign of the Stuart Devlin? They have not. Hmm. I say if he's in Boston, he's very hard to find. Either he doesn't want to be found or he could be using an assumed identity. But as far as we know, nobody's been asking around about Crown and Shield or Braun or any of those guys. But we're, we're still working on it, Mr. Sparks. We'll let you know if we found out anything. All right. Well, we were gone for a couple of days. I just wanted to check in. No. Yep. Um, okay, so I vote. So what we'll actually right now before we move on, hold that thought. Yep. We should. There should be some sort of mechanism uh, to uh, to communicate with the Pinkertons. You guys have been using the Pinkertons for communication with others, uh, telegrams, delivering mail, for instance. Uh, Jacob Cronenshield's mail, Yusufus Braun's mail, and stuff is all. You guys have made arrangements in the past uh, for this stuff to be, you know, picked up, delivered by the Pinkertons, and stuff like that. But what they would be wanting wanting to know, I think, is like, what if we can't find you? You know, like, uh, is there is, is there some way that we can 
create some kind of system or a location, um, whether it be you know a PO box um, or a certain uh, say like a like a transunion uh, telegram office, a specific one or something like that. Is there something that we can set up so that we can easily communicate with you? or quickly be able to quickly communicate with you if we find out anything or if you need to get a hold of us. You know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, you know how to reach them by telephone, but they don't necessarily know how to reach you by telephone. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of the times the Pinkertons could spend days or even weeks trying to track you guys down if they have something, uh, if they have information for you sparks so that they're kind of asking you like is there something we can do to uh you know in a worst case scenario um contact you can we can we we have a a ham radio Mm, i don't think that's a thing no Uh, i know shortwave radio is a thing but as far as like civilian radio like that i'm not sure uh, just set up we'll set up an anonymous p.o box Where that means you've got to go uh, check it yeah. all the time. What city we yeah. set that up? In? Right, that's just kind of along the lines of what I'm talking about. But you know, I don't know. I'm. I think maybe maybe telegrams would would be okay. But the thing is, is they they kind of basically what they're asking you guys is like we you guys need to keep us informed of your movements in a way. You know what I'm saying? At least in a general sense. Because if you if you guys want the benefit of you know receiving information like for instance from Jacob's lawyers um, or if Devlin if he turns up or any news on Edgar Casey if he turns up or whatever how are they going to be able to contact you if you're in the nether regions of the the world you know just something to think about so they're they're kind of you know asking you about this and wondering uh, what the best solution to something like that would be. I think we're just going to have to check in with them regularly because we don't even know we're going to be half the time. Hmm. Can we use Morris code? Yeah, that can be done through pretty much any telegraph office. They still use Morris code to some extent. They got to know where to send the code though to us. Right. Yeah, but, but we could Morris them. Yeah, we could Morris them and have them send and have us have them send it back. Yes, checking in, send it to this address or whatever. So by 1928, the transoceanic cables uh, that transmitted long distance communications for the most part began converting over to long wave and short wave wireless services by about 1928. So no, yeah, so short wave ham radius is really not a thing. It's more actual cables under the ocean still at this point. Um. Hmm. All right. That's something, so it's just, just something, yeah, something to keep in mind, just something to think about. So we just got to remember that there's a lot of us that reach out to these guys. Yeah, up till now I've just kind of played it fast and loose. I'll, you know, I don't know, I don't, you know, I'm sure you've noticed. I'll be like, yeah, well, Ben Knuckles or the Pinkertons get in touch with you and give you Jacob's right. mail with this or whatever. But as you guys start moving about, you know, Ireland, if you wind, if you wind up in the Antarctic or something, you know, who, you know, how how's anybody going to know where you are, or whatever? Let's just try to check. We'll try to check in, uh, yeah. guys. Let's try to remember to be a little more. You know, we'll check in a little more frequently with them. How about right. sim- how about we just use semaphore? What? That's what they use, like the flags outside oh. of the roads. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 All right. What? <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll, so, you, we'll build so, you guys, so you guys are driving through the Massachusetts wilderness back to Boston with your newly acquired Necronomicon. Um talking about stuff and Sparky you're beginning to catch glimpses in your mind's eye about that night at the meeting hall and you remember shooting somebody in the head and then you realize it starts coming back to you you start remembering what happened that night 
just a little bits and pieces at this point. Okay. How, how am I feeling? Uneasy or? A little uneasy, yeah. It was very traumatic for you. Um, you think of the shadow. You can't quite see it in your mind. Um, you know that Van Helsing saw it. I don't know if he's actually described it to you. Probably not. Uh, but yeah, the, the shadow looming before you. Uh, it's just a black shadow. You can't. It's almost as if your mind won't let you see it at this point. Whatever it was, it was terrible. Mm. Yeah, I'm not going to describe it to you. I rub my temples. Doctor's merciful. Yeah, your cousin Jacob certainly remembers it. And uh, you see what's done to him. Doctor, he's looking, you think he's looking for sharp you objects. Would help me out. Yeah. I'm sure it will. <laughs> Well, let's keep that as a uh, possible treatment. Here, and I got some morphine, too, if you want to take a hit of that. That'll calm you down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off. Maybe just a uh, brandy or something when we get back to the boat. <laughs> um, I can tell you one more thing that the Pinkertons contact you about when they let you know. And they're asking you these questions and stuff like that. They have told you that recently in, in the newspapers, in the obituaries in New York, um, they've been able to identify uh, some of these people who were more or less members of Look to the Future, or at least a, attendees of the meetings. Um, and their descriptions of the way they died do not match in any way, shape, or form uh, to what you guys witnessed that night. The apparently, you know, the papers and stuff are saying there were no victims of this fire. That you know, there was no meeting that night and all this kind of stuff. No witnesses or anything like that. Um, so apparently, you know, if of course, what you say is true. They're, they're telling the Pinkertons are telling you that it looks like there's a cover up uh, as far as what happened that night uh, in, in uh, uptown in Manhattan. There. Hmm. Why would they and, cover it up? And interestingly, um, there are signs of uh, they've been cleaning the area up, and it looks like there are signs of reconstruction going on at the uh, site. Really? Looks like, looks like they may re be rebuilding the uh, meeting hall. Wow. Another government contractor doing it? Uh, well, we don't know. We're trying to find out. But they, they've bulldozed the site. Um, and they have things staked out. And it uh, looks like they're, like they're going to be building again on that site. Hmm. At least that's what we think. Can anybody pose as a as a workman, construction worker, gain access to the basement? You're asking the Pinkertons to do that. Um, I'm 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 asking us here in the uh, right. house. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. In general, you know, what do you think about that idea? There's got to be something down there. Well, there's also the annex building, too. Yep. Alessio, uh, Alessio's like, you know, he can disguise skill doing that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I could apply that to other people, too. You know, he's also <laughs> probably pretty experienced and knowledgeable about nighttime operations as well. So, you know, that's an option. All depends on what you guys want to do. I think we should go at night and explore this basement. Chilling. Re remember, remember what you saw there that night, Dr. Van Helsing. There at that place. You're talking about going back to the, the place in New York? Yeah. Yeah, the place where you saw the shadow. I think we shadow. ought to. I think we ought to go. I think we should disrupt their operation here in Boston again. All right. You're right. I, and, you're right. That's a good idea. And and then then we should head to we should head to to Scotland. 
All right. And let's let's let them get their shit together a little bit more over at the at the uh, the place there in New York, and then we can come back when they're not as prepared for us. Yeah, and and don't take what I say. Uh, you know, don't give what I say too much credence. I'm just trying to creep you guys out. You, you're 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 fairly certain that there is some underground structure at that locale. No doubt. It's just I'm trying to say, you know, hmm, you know, going back there after what happened, what what happened is would be sort of daunting for just about anybody. E- even though Van Helsing was able to keep his sanity intact after witnessing that, um, it it gave you the chills a little bit thinking about even going back there and and risking witnessing that or even something worse. I mean. Hitting your hitting your enemy in different places too is not a bad strategy. No. But yeah, you can be almost certain that there is some sort of underground structure there, and uh, apparently, uh, they are those guys. Those cultists are still in place to at least some extent, according to the Pinkertons uh, at that locale at the annex, um, in the former site of the meeting hall. Uh, well, you know. and, of, and of course, the Hermetic Order of the Silver Twilight, their lodge is still in Boston, doing what they do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's not good. Unlike the Crown and Shield Manor, which is burnt to the ground. What if we What if we get a couple more of those uh, beasties? Should be motivation. Should be motivation for you guys. Beasties? Yeah, those beasties we sent last time to go get us the books. Remember. What if we got the a airy couple more? Travelers. Yeah, the airy travelers. Airy tra- travelers and have them uh, burn that place to the ground. Yeah. Or help us burn it to the ground. They can just come with us. Yeah, they were like mole bird monkeys or whatever they were. Assuming Carl Stanford isn't there to help turn them on us. Yeah, he old old Stanford hasn't made an appearance in in a while. Not since that night at the meeting hall. You can be fairly certain that John Scott's probably still lingering around the lodge in Boston, being that he is the grand philosopher of the lodge, and Barry Pollard, Barry Pollard as well. Maybe we should set up a sting on those guys and try to take them out. Yeah, Defend I think them. I think Pollard's definitely. I mean, you guys know where this dude lives. We should set up outside. I'll disguise all of us in like workman's clothes, a priest, you know, something else. We'll we'll hang out, and if the opportunity arises, he's there. We'll little. That's what Alessio says. Let's find this fuck. Let's find this fucker and kill him. All right, I think that's a good one. Just do it the mob. Just do it the mob way. You just yeah. He's like, we gotta, we gotta pick these guys off. We'll, we'll get this guy first. Yeah, you do it. You do it like the mob way. Like you trail him one night, you know, late at night or something, you know, and you get him on a loan, get him alone in a subway car or something. Walk up to him. Yeah. Just be like Barry Pollard, and look at you like what? And then you just stab him in the throat, or whatever, you know. Oh well, I, yeah, I, I can. Uh, my stealth is pretty good. I can yep. sneak up behind him and pull out the wire. Make him a nice suit. Make him like something that. nice. Yeah, let's start taking these guys out. That's gonna help. It's gonna help our sanity too. It's gonna make us feel better, as we know that these things start getting shut down one by one. Well, I'll tell you what. It's getting a little late. We're about the end of the session. Are oh, you guys want a week to think about it? Yeah. Yeah, but let's yeah let's start there the next week. Uh, start going back to Boston and taking these guys out at the uh, Silver Twilight. Okay, pa- Pollard Pollard's the first. Or we we can set up. We'll, we'll talk about who we want to set up on. We can do, use... we can do Godfather Part One style and like get all five of them all at once. You know, like during some like baptism. <laughs> well, you know they have meetings. Yeah, kind of general meetings on Tuesday nights. And you know that they have the 2 a.m. meetings every once in a while for the higher initiations. Probably wouldn't be too hard to find out when those are. That piques Alessio's 
interest. <laughs> he likes how the doctor thinks. And the doctor. All in one place. It's a good. Yep. Yep, the doctor. <laughs> the doctor wants blood. Absolutely. Your poor daughter. Yep. Pregnant daughter. Yeah, poor pumpkin. Poor pumpkin. I thought, she, I thought we scraped her womb out. She's. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's she's right. not pregnant. Let's not that's... go there. We, that <laughs> <laughs> we, we took right. care of that abomination. That's right. That's right. You're right. You're right. Oh, goodness. <laughs> it's a harsh world. It's a harsh world. Oh. Yeah, I'm like, no, 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 she is not pregnant because otherwise we got to go get our money back from the coat hanger doctor. <clears throat> Who is out of Sawgoth or something. That's all I need. Exactly. Daddy. <laughs> all right. Well, you guys got some good clues tonight, um, at least uh, as to maybe some of the members of the order overseas. Yeah, the French it, chick. It, yeah, it's good to know names. Yeah, the French chick uh, and this Belfagor person, though. You haven't really found any information on him, uh, but apparently he's he's one of them as well. Um, and you've got the name of uh, uh, Dr. Lorne McParlin in Canich, who apparently was a friend of Henry Hancock. So he'll he'll be if you guys ever do get up to Canich, he'd be a he'd be a guy that you'd probably want to talk to. Um, and we know they're looking for an item that's in like three pieces or something. Yes. And they find one piece or, or something. Right. This is a super productive session. Lots of lots of great info and lots of great roles by Sparky and the doctor. Yeah, the roles made a difference for sure. I mean, it's very tempting as a keeper for this game to to want to give you guys clues to kind of keep you keep it moving forward and whatever. But, you know, every now and then there's a clue that's really kind of essential that I'll give you a lot of times without even having you roll for it. But a number of the clues tonight are, are, is stuff that I probably wouldn't have given you if you didn't make the rolls, you know. Kind of semi-inconsequential stuff, but um, even the, the slightest clue can give you some insight. Um, Plus it adds, it, adds to the, it adds to the whole story, you know, it's great. You know the stuff about the the witch. You know, it's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, there's some serious shit going down in uh, in Scotland. I, I would highly recommend you guys go there at some point. And of course, uh, I would think that Alessio, to some extent, would be as time goes by, you know, would be kind of pushing for that because it's awesome. He's oh, yeah. got a debt to pay, and uh, he wants to kill these guys here. Let's kill some of these guys, and then we'll get the hell out of here. Yeah, how, how long, that's his. That's his whole push. How long would it take to get across the pond? Uh, about six days by steamer. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, about six days to. Uh, what is it? Uh, chink -a -chink -a to give you an idea. Um, yeah, it's about six days across the pond. Then I believe you would arrive at, I can't remember the name of the city, but then you would head inland to Inverness, uh, which is kind of a, a major city. And then Canich is a uh, is a kind of a day trip outside of there up into the mountains. Um, so it could take seven or eight days uh, sailing from New York uh, to get there. So you'd have a good good week to get there. And then, of course, you have to take into consideration um, customs laws and things like that. I mean, you're you're traveling to Britain, so you know the, the, the Tommy guns can be hard to get in, and even even handguns and shit like that. It's something you guys want to take into consideration, or make arrangements for, in some way or another. Arrangements shall be made. Yeah, but of course, uh, hunting rifles, shotguns are are plentiful over there, so. Uh, but it it will be fairly fairly difficult to. Uh, I wonder if there's a if there's a mob connection over there, or if Masseria knows someone in England. 
possibly. Because I could, that's approach him. I need yeah. to go say hello to him anyways and give him a gift. It's just the, the traveling is the hard part, you know, um, going through. Trying to they're, force they're something very, there. Very, yeah, they're very, very strict. I mean, even, I mean, you can't even carry a knife in your pocket in, in England at this point. So I, I think they, even today, it's it's illegal to carry a pocket knife. And it's this the same. So even something as relatively harmless as that, it's going to be difficult. I'm going to make it hard on you guys. <laughs> you better try. Well, it's better to try to acquire stuff there. Yes. Yeah. That that that's the key. You know, with, without getting use, popped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, try to use my underworld connections if that's possible. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see as are, but but for the most part, you're thinking in your mind, just from what you know. Especially especially you, Lee, your character would know more about the customs, regulations, and rules and laws and stuff uh, in Europe and Britain and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can get us something in England. Come on, buddy. Yeah, you're definitely taking into consideration in your mind. Like if we're going to travel to Scotland, what are we going to bring with us? Not only as far as weapons wise, but you know, this other stuff that you guys have, you're going to want to keep it safe and secure. And I mean, I can't see you really hand trucking a safe around with you up in the Scottish Highlands for one thing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like right. you, you guys are going to have to figure some of that, some of the logistics out. Sure. I wonder if Torrance could help with the customs at all. That, that's a definite possibility. That's, what, that's the first thing I think of as far as like, I think uh, I think Torrance, nothing major, but I think Torrance, because of his connections, might be able to help. And uh, I think he could try, but I mean the, I mean don't don't get too. Uh, as far as connections in England, not necessarily like yeah, but I mean don't don't get too optimistic about bringing whatever you want into England. They're they're very strict, and very thorough. Alessio, Alessio's got an advantage there because, you know, as long as he finds some piano wire and a freaking kitchen knife, he's fine. You know, go I, just to work. Cricket, I just need a cricket bat. Well, there you go. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. You just, go to, hard, you just go to the hardware store and get your nails course, and your claw hammer. Exactly. Of course, if, we can, if we can somehow acquire firearms, that would be awesome, too. Yeah, well, we'll see about that. Like I said, don't get your hopes up. You might have to get lucky. Uh, in order for that to happen, you know how the Brits are. It's it's probably pretty hard to to bribe a a British customs official. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, especially especially with you know. I mean, look at you guys. <laughs> I mean, well, maybe. Yeah. People, I mean, God, if only the ambassador were with you guys. Uh, you know, oh my God, he's the British ambassador. He'd probably float you guys over there on a navy ship or something. Yeah. That's exactly. I was just thinking that. Just thinking that. He would have been perfect. Bye. All right, gentlemen. All right, fellas. That was awesome. Awesome yeah, session. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Sean. That was great. Yeah, great game. Thank you. Nice, yeah. nice, nice to be back. It is nice to yeah. be back. I look I look forward to the next. Shit's gonna ramp up here pretty quick, I think. Oh boy. Yep. Um so I hate to say this, but uh, you know we do need to roll up backup characters. I, I hate, I'd hate to get an hour into a session and then have everybody die and be like, "Okay, let's roll new characters." <laughs> you know. Okay. Um, nice. And I would suggest too. You know, I mean, I know you guys are busy and everything, but what what I'll do is I'll I'll leave the character generation page up um, in here. So if you wanted to, if you have an hour free and an evening or something, log into roll twenty and just start rolling some dice and start just follow the steps, you know, one through 10 or whatever it is, uh, and at least get a skeleton of a, of a dude, you know, oh, okay. that's yeah. cool. Right. I always thought it was kind of fun rolling up call of Cthulhu characters. Uh, Great fun, man. Picking the skills and picking yeah. what you have and doing and, and the what, background. Yeah. And what you can do is at the very top of the journal here, there's the character generation, uh, menu or whatever. You can open that up, and it's got everything you need to roll up characters in here. Um, and I'll put some more blank character sheets in there. I've got 
Kyle and Tom, there's some backup sheets for you in there already. Got it. Okay. I see it. Okay. So, so yeah, if you get some free time, feel free to just pop in and roll up a dude. Well, yeah, the, the instructions are pretty thorough and and easy to understand. If you have any questions, just ask me on Discord or something. Cool. So, All right. But yeah, it'll be good to have backup characters. It's just a, a thing that, that will come in handy, I'm sure, some at some point. But I'm going to roll up another one. <laughs> yeah, but you, you never know, though. I mean, in my experience, I mean, back, even back in the day playing with Harry Campbell, I think I had a pilot character that survived an entire campaign. Of course, he was mostly insane by the end of the campaign and whatever. But you never know. Van Helsing might, you know, might persevere through the through the thick and, you know, through the thick of it, the, the worst of the worst and come out on the other side with. Who knows? <laughs> Big bottle of cocaine. Exactly. <laughs> you just never know. Awesome. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, now you don't have to roll up a backup character with the Greek language. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm going to anyway. But yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Good night. We'll see you next week. All right, All right man. Yeah. Thanks. Sounds good, John. Good night, everybody. Good night. Yeah. <laughs>